Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us this morning for this special um, meeting of the San Jose Charter Commission. Um, today is November 6th, so I'm going to call this uh, study session, and uh, first I'm going to call this day session to order. So the clerk, please take the roll. Barbara Marshman. Christina Johnson. Elizabeth Monley. Here. Ellie Masamura. Enrico Callender. Frank Maitsky. Here. Garrick Percival. Here. George Sanchez. Hui Tran. Jeremy Barus. Here. Jose Posadas. Here. Lund Diep. Present. Oh, I see Luis on the other side. I'll promote him quickly. Linda Lazat. Luis Barosio. Here. Thank you. Magnolia Siegel. Present. Maria Fuentes. Here. Sammy Robledo. Sherry Segura. Here. T. Tran. Tobin Gilman. Here. Veronica Amador. Here. <clears throat> Yong Zhao. Here. And Frederick Ferrer. Here. Um, I see that. I see that um, uh, Commissioner Marshman has also joined us. Is there anyone else that joined us who is in the role? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Megan. Um, at this time, we're gonna, I wanna walk through just a little bit of our agenda today to make sure that um, since we have a number of attendees coming in from the public, um, and I wanted to walk through the two parts of our meeting today. First, we just called the study session together uh, to order, and we will walk through the study session, which will be, uh, we'll be hearing a presentation from the reimagining committee, um, and then commissioners will have a chance to have discussion around that and then ask questions, and then there will be uh, public comment. At that time, we will then move to a second part of our meeting today, which is a public hearing. And the public hearing session, we will go through each of the recommendations that was made last Monday at our commission meeting, um, those, those um, recommendations will be reviewed again in a short presentation, uh, and then we will hear from the public. In the public hearing, the commissioners will not be asking questions or having discussion. Any of the comments that or questions that are raised will be discussed at our, net, our at our commission meeting, uh, which will um, which I'll talk about at the end of our meeting today. Um, so today, our first part of our meeting is our study session. And I understand, um, Commissioner Siegel, that um, our guest today is Sandra Asher, is one of our guests. Are there anyone else um, coming from Reimagining that's presenting today? I'm not in charge of Reimagining. I think Sandra Asher is, um, I just know that the city manager has asked Reimagining not to directly speak to us and has asked us not to directly speak, but only speak in individual capacities. So that came up. And other than that, I don't know, that would be a good question for um, Ms. Asher. Okay, but that's the guest, but that's the guest we've invited today um, for this study session. So we'll start there. Um, Sandra is, see, there you are. Hi, Sandra, welcome. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Sandra Asher, and I'm a co-lead of the Accountability and Reform Subcommittee of the Reimagining Public Safety Community Advisory Committee. I was nominated by Parents Helping Parents, our Family Engagement and Resource Center in Santa Clara County for Parents of Special Needs Children, where I'm a board member, to advocate the voice of the disability community. I'm also a board member at Community Solutions and a member of Parents for Change, a disability justice advocacy group. And finally, I'm a voter in District 10. 
Um, as Magnolia, uh, Commissioner Magnolia mentioned, I am only here in my personal capacity to discuss issues related to policing and the opinions expressed here are entirely my own. I've been reminded by the city manager that I need to say that, so I just wanted to clearly sp state that. As a disabled person and mom of a special needs son, it scares me to routinely hear of disabled people being mistreated by law enforcement. According to the Bureau of Justice, two in 10 prisoners and three in 10 jail inmates have a cognitive disability. More than 25% of those who are later exonerated after giving a false confession to police had characteristics of an intellectual disability. And between one third and one half of people shot and killed by police in the US have a disability. So disability has long merged with race in the sense of the historic and current violence, stigma and marginalization to expose them to the highest form of risk. Parents Helping Parents, in collaboration with the Silicon Valley Independent Living Center, San Andreas Regional Center, Hope Services, and Sacred Heart, held a listening session in early October where participants shared their experiences with and perspectives on policing and what law enforcement needs to better understand about the disability community and what they would like to see changed in law enforcement. Based on what the community shared during that session, I believe the proposed change in oversight model is important in helping restore the disability community's trust in San Jose PD. I believe the time is now for community oversight to be part of the city's charter, and that includes the ability to investigate, hire and fire, and speak to police procedure and protocols. So I support the proposal recommending an inspector general, an oversight committee, and an independent office of investigation. I'd now like to turn over uh, to Lori Valdez, who also sits on the Accountability and Reform Subcommittee. So if you would please uh, promote Lori. We promoted Lori. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, Lori. Thank okay. you. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Lori Valdez, and I am on the Reimagining Public Safety Steering Committee. But I am speaking today not on behalf of the committee, but as myself, my family, as an impacted family member of police violence in San Jose. Um, it is very important that. Um, the charter is given the capacity to create the community oversight for police because um, families like mine have children who have to grow up with this trauma that has, in, that has been inflicted on our family. My son was four when his father was killed and he's 12 now and he still struggles with that trauma that it is impacting him at school. And so therefore, unless we can get some accountability and support, we need to not allow officers to no longer investigate themselves because they'll never find anything wrong with them. Community oversight so they can not only investigate, but also make sure that there are charges and that they are upheld and that they are held accountable to the community because millions and millions of tax dollars are being paid for these lawsuits to continue to have these bad officers on the street and then the, the you know the city always wants to give them more money they need to start investing in our children the ones that are being traumatized in the schools for mental health counselors trauma-informed counselors we cannot no longer continue to ignore that the children are suffering and those are the most vulnerable and our community needs to realize that our children my son is not invisible neither are all the other children who have lost their father because of police they're growing up in our city traumatized and nobody cares and we need to start caring about them. So I'm 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 really agreeing with the charter review commission for them to be for them to be able to do what they have to do so they can restore safety in our communities and they can prevent more children and families to be living this living hell. It's basically the lives that we had once before are no longer the same lives that 
we once had. This is an unfamiliar territory that we are forced to live with, and it's not fair because there's no accountability. And day after day, we are re-triggered when another person, another family has to begin to walk in our shoes because it's not a journey. I wish on any of you, any of you, because it's not an easy journey to walk, especially when the, the support of our community is very scarce and and there's no support for emotional you know counseling for the children there's no support for nothing for us they deny us everything so we have to do this on our own so i please encourage you know the city to allow the charter commission to do its work to allow it to be part of the city charter because this is something that has long been needed and long been ignored and um it's no longer acceptable thank you Thank you, Ms. Valdez. And our next guest is, uh, I believe has been promoted and that's Sharon Anthony. Sharon, welcome. So we've uh, asked Sharon to go to the panelist side. Okay, she just accepted. Okay, now can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome, Sharon, okay. for joining us. Um, I prepared a statement. It takes about two minutes, so um, I don't know how much time I have, but I know that uh, I don't have a lot of time. But um, first, let me introduce myself. My name is Sharon Watkins, and I'm the mother of Philip Watkins, who was shot and killed by San Jose police officers So and Dote on February 11, 2015. According to the district attorney, the officers were within the law when they killed my son and no charges were filed. This was a great injustice to me, my family, his fiance, and at the time, mostly to his daughter, who she was two and a half years old when her dad was killed. Um, she will be uh, 10 in uh, June, next June. So anyway, um, I did not and will not accept this as end of story. I've researched the law as it pertains to police conduct and use of force. And I have found in my ongoing research that there's a great imbalance between ordinary citizens and the police. First of all, the officer's conduct is reviewed by other officers and that smells of um, conflict of interest. Secondly, uh, there's a commonality with the officers being investigated. They fear for their life is, uh, that seems to be their quote unquote, get out of jail free card. No matter the situation, if an officer states they feel feared for their life, they are exonerated. Uh, and uh, lastly, let's talk about this fear. An officer cannot successfully, successfully protect a community when they live in fear. Uh, they cannot have good judgment when they live in fear. And there can be no good relationship between the community and the cop when the officer lives in fear. And also that causes the community to live in fear. I live in fear daily. Every time I see someone pulled over for an office with an officer, I wonder if that person gonna live through that traffic stop. Uh, we're constantly hearing about people being killed and officers not being charged. And each time that happens, we relive by we, I mean the community of people impacted by uh, police violence. We relive all of our trauma, we re relive the pain, and we try to connect with the families just to show them that we are there to support. Uh, there cannot be a good relationship when we've got everybody living in fear. Um, the state, the state of fear is just, it kills us and it, there's no justice, especially when there's no justice for the community. Um, I don't agree with investigation of police involved shootings or violence being, uh, investigated by law enforcement. Um, I think that's an open door to corruption and also to bias. So I am full support of a community oversight. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Ms. Davis. Thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, are there any other speakers that are coming from reimagining Commissioner Siegel that we know of? That's a question for um, Ms. Osher. 
Okay, um, Ms. Osher, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Siegel. Ms. Osher, do we have any other speakers? Uh, no, that is um, our last speaker. Um, okay. But I wanted to add one other comment um, that I forgot in my previous uh, notes. In meeting with um, the use of force trainer for San Jose PD, myself and the Parents for Change uh, advocacy group, ask them about their use of force training. And especially for people with various disabilities and mental illnesses, I was um, very disenfranchised to hear him say that they consider anyone who is non-responsive and not maintaining eye contact to be considered a criminal planning an escape. And when I informed him very calmly that, um, you know, this could be a result of many disabilities, right? Someone who is deaf, someone who is autistic, someone with an intellectual disability, someone who's having an anxiety attack. Um, there could be many reasons besides someone being a criminal for that type of behavior. He looked at me in very deadpan and said, well, that's unfortunate. And that lack of accountability and empathy in our law enforcement just um, feels like it's not the right approach. That is not how we should have people engaging and thinking of our community members. And that's another driver of why I think we need a strong community oversight to um, oversee our San Jose PD. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Asher, and for the other guests coming from Reimagining speaking on their own behalf today. Um, I'll now open it up to any questions, comments, feedback from commissioners. I just want to remind everyone we will come to, to the recommendation later this morning. At this point, are there questions uh, for reimagining or any uh, comments from uh, on the reimagining uh, component? Okay, seeing none, I'm gonna to go to the public. I'm sorry, Commissioner Amador. Yes, um, I just wanna say thank you to Ms. Asher, Shannon and Ms. Um, I'm sorry, um, our other speaker. Uh, you know, it just brought a lot right now, Ms. Asher. I have a son with a disability who can't stand, you know, eye contact and it, it as a mother, it really hurts, right? And he's, he's young and, and just knowing that if he ever confronts somebody that he will be seen as confrontational because he can't stand his eye contact with somebody else it brings a lot of worry it brings a lot of worry i thank you for your advocacy i thank you for standing here and continuing to advocate thank you so much Thank you, Commissioner Amador. I will now go to, I um, just want to make sure I have no other commissioners. Uh, I'll now go to the public. Um, again, remember, reminding the public that what we're asking for is comments on the presentations uh, and feedback to the commission. We will have a recommendation on uh, the police commission uh, later in this morning's agenda. Uh, clerk can call the first speaker. Paul Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, as, a, as a citizenry, the, I don't think that the police department or the council is really in a position, in a moral, like they, they're not bringing moral authority because we're doing this because of their failures. All of us are having this discussion because of their failures. So they do not get to set the terms. We are demanding these changes, I think, considering the brutal history that Chicanos have experienced in this city, I think, I think that my ancestors and my elders deserve that. And I'm not asking. And there isn't a whole lot of other people in this community that's not asking. We are demanding. Because this is what democracy looks like. Yes, you know, the democracy isn't polite. It's not, it's not uh, just, uh, okay, well, you just got to mind your tone, mind your manners. This is how it's done because the, the urgency of the moment is being played around with. They're, they're, we see very clearly that the democratic process is being compromised and circumvented because of politics, because they don't want to relinquish their power. So when they mouth equity, when you mouth inclusion, when you mouth uh, diversity from the dais, 
it rings hollow like a discordant, uh, like a discordant instrument. It strikes the note and it doesn't hit. Why? Because it's not tuned, because it's not coming from a correct source. So I'm asking you, because if you compromise this process, the city can no longer claim moral authority for its laws. It just, it can't. You, you can't claim authority over those laws when you do not put the creation of those laws into the hands of the very people that are going to be held to account to them. And that is the sin. sin. Pancho Guevara. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Uh, my name is Poncho Guevara. I'm the executive director of Sacred Heart Community Service, a member of the Race Equity Action Leadership Coalition, and a member of the Reimagining Public Safety Community Advisory Committee. Um, I want to offer my strong support and the support of uh, our organization and, and many others that, that are weighing in on the need for a strong community oversight body to be part of your recommendations to the city council. Um, the need to be able to do this has been reinforced by some of my colleagues that are on the uh, on, on the reimagining process, and um, and we really appreciate the work that's been done by your subcommittee to actually help um, identify some of the core functions of that body to be able to not only uh, be able to look at policy at a larger level, but investigate um, look at uh, the power to be able to do some investigation policies and procedures and protocols, looking at hiring policies uh, hiring and hiring policies for the council and being able to go even further at looking at, at some of the provisions that need to be changed, be brought into the provisions with the, with the contract with the Peace Officers Association. So we strongly believe that this is the, the time is right now to be able to do this. Um, I know that many of the, uh, we were not, the city attorney's office said that we couldn't speak directly to you as a representative of that, but this is uh, but we have had those conversations at a committee level and an entire committee level that this is the right course of action for you to take. So thank you for your consideration and looking forward to more dialogue with you in the future and helping to support this um, proposal if it comes through your through your process to the city council among others that you're considering. Thank you. Tessa wood -Mancy. Tessa? Okay, good. Where is this? Let me see. Let me see. Hi, you hear me? You can hear me? Yes. Hi. Yes. Oh, I love, we love you. I'm at my farmer's market. I'm trying to do too many things. All right, sweetheart. Um, so, yes, I was very, very impressed with the uh, dialogue about the dis disabled. That was very moving and very concerning. And these are the beautiful things that's happening in our city is this Charter Review Commission. And we're looking at the people's agenda. And it, it's so critical to do that. And in this day and age where we are having so many crises and that this, this is very critical to our well-being. And it needs to be, you know, our city is saying, oh, we're going to shoo-shoo all this. We're going to deal with the real issues, the politics of when we vote and who, you know, how strong a mayor and all that BS, blah, blah, blah. We need to deal with what's going on with the people. And we finally have a chance to do that with our charter, this, these issues that are being brought up. They are all so critical. And to hear the pain and suffering of, of, the, of the people who are disabled have been killed by the police and with no support, like she was explaining, to her children and how the children are suffering. We see that with gun violence and, 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 and how they're having to go through, you know, um, you know active shooter you know, things in our classrooms, besides having it in your home where your father is killed, you know, and so there's so many critical issues as we're going forward. And, and these are very important for us to be looking at and, the, and, and demanding that our city um, include these in our charter, the people's issues, and not to say that it's not important. We can't allow that. This is too serious of an issue to have politics playing, you know, being, being the deciding far factor as we go fire, f forward, because we are facing so many crises uh, of public health and public well being. Brett Bymaster. Hi, my name is Brett Bymaster, Executive Director of Healing Grove Health Center. And uh, Healing Grove uh, recently did a study of more than 400 Spanish speaking Latinos to see what their views on the Charter Review Commission were. And I'd really like to encourage you, you can go right now to bit.ly 
slash SJ Charter 2021. Again, that's bit.ly slash SJ Charter 2021. Uh, the thing that we want the Charter uh, Review Commission to consider today is the position of the Chief of Police. You know, we clearly have to do police reform. We clearly need a police department that's working with our community and partnering strongly with our community to make sure that, that we're safe. And I agree with the speaker's earlier position that, you know, if the police are scared or if we're scared, no one's going to be doing well. And we think it's critical that the police chief is directly appointed by the city council and mayor by 11 people. Right now in the current charter, the police chief is appointed by the city manager. And what that means is the city manager can hire or fire the police chief at will anytime without direct democratic uh, um, uh, input. So we think actually the most critical change that needs to be made, and we'd really like to ask the Charter Review Commission to consider this, is to move the chief of police to being directly appointed by the majority of the city council. Um, if you go to bit.ly slash sjcharter2021, you can see a chart there where we've, we've got the options of the two different uh, weak mayor systems, one where the police chief is appointed by the city manager and one where the police chief is appointed by the majority of the council. We'd really like to ask that the Charter Review Commission considers the police chief to be appointed democratically by the majority of the council so that we can be ensured that whenever we hire or fire the police chief, it's done uh, in a democratic way uh, with the input of the full city. Sorry, I couldn't get the, the little pop-up to pop up to unmute. Jose Maladona. Jose. Maladona. Yeah, aquí estoy. Yeah, estoy aquí. Discúlpeme. Uh, muy bien, uh, estoy como habitante, como, como, oh, wait, como ciudadano on? de aquí de San José, Ho preocupado Jose? por eh, muchos temas de señor. violencia y, bueno, y que... Can you stop for just a second? Yeah. Um, in order to yeah. hear the translation, please go to either the English or the Spanish channel. I'm not sure which one they're translating on today. Um, so you'll go down, you'll go to interpretation and select um, English or Spanish, you just- You're gonna have to say that in Spanish. Yeah. She doesn't speak English. She's talking to you. She's talking to us. If yeah, we want to see the translation into English, at the bottom yes. of your screen, go to translation and click on English. Yeah, go to interpretation. The, the, the per Jose is getting this interpretation from our interpreter. So he is, be, he is able to hear what I'm saying. But I'm saying to anybody who's watching as an attendee, you know, participant, a panelist, go to the interpretation button at the bottom of your screen and select either the English or the Spanish channel. Um, some of the interpreters use the English channel and some use the Spanish channel. I'm not sure which they're using right now. You may need to toggle back and forth until you hear the, um, the English translation of the speaker. So I'm going to give Jose um, four minutes total. Um, that's state law when somebody's using an interpreter. So it will run a two minute timer and then I'll restart the two minute timer if he needs the additional time. Um, and Jose, thank you for your patience while I explain this to everybody. Um, and I won't need to explain that again because you've all heard this. So this is the only time I'm making that announcement for the meeting. Um, Jose, go ahead. Gracias. Um, ya, yeah, eh, ya me escuchan, ¿verdad? Sí, ok. Uh, mire, eh, estoy como habitante de San José preocupado porque uh, a pesar, hay mucho conflicto en la, en la comunidad, eh, muchos tiroteos, uh, mucha violencia contra los discapacitados y algunas otras personas. Y creemos que es muy importante que el, el, el jefe de policía Sea, sea una persona cercana a nosotros, que sea elegida democráticamente por, por el, el, el consejo de la ciudad y no, y no por el, el, el administrador, porque uh, de esa manera eh, creo que se está haciendo más político o, o se está politizando 
la elección de nuestro jefe de policía y en cualquier momento puede ser removido o quitado eh, dependiendo a los intereses eh, eh, de la ciudad y no de nosotros como ciudadanía o como, o como, como habitantes. Entonces, uh, eso es nuestro, lo que estamos eh, queriendo eh, enfatizar y, y, y promover, que, que realmente eh, sea un proceso justo, un proceso en donde, eh, donde se ha elegido democráticamente quién nos está vigilando y quién está al tanto de, nuestras, uh, de nuestra seguridad, para nosotros sentir que, que realmente ellos están enfocados, como policía, están enfocados a sus funciones primarias y no a intereses, um, a intereses personales o, o, o fácticos eh, eh, acerca de nuestra, de nuestra seguridad, eh, en especial de mi familia. Estoy muy, muy, muy preocupado por eso. Entonces, um, esa es mi postura. Muchas gracias. Anna Malara Glenn. Yes, um, good early afternoon. Uh, I am a member, I would say, of my parish, Holy Family. I uh, am a staff member at Sacred Heart Community Service, and I'm a voter in District 2. I've been a longtime resident with my family here, raised my daughters here, and uh, we are concerned about the ability of police enforcement to use excessive force, uh, intimidation, and behavior that suggests bias and uh, even racism. Uh, I, as a Latina woman, have been stopped by the police. And honestly, I am completely terrified when that happens because I don't have those things happen to me often. Uh, for traffic stops, I might have been stopped one time, maybe a long time ago. But the point is, I don't know what my rights are in that case. And I certainly, just out of fear of being uh, arrested for being, uh, you know, uncooperative or confrontational with the police, uh, I fear for all of those, as someone said earlier, who are pulled over for a traffic violation. I wish someone would explain to me why it takes three or four squad cars to be on the scene for something like that. Uh, but it does seem to be a misuse of police force. Again, maybe out of intimidation. Uh, I am in complete support of, of uh, the community oversight. Uh, uh, I think in particular, I'm going to voice something that doesn't always get voiced, which is if you want a stronger police force, you need to think of the police officers who want to completely abide by their best practices as police officers and truly want to do a good job and be the kind of police officer that the community needs. And the fact that there must be some corrupting forces in call in user two. I can't agree anymore with all these callers. And I've been saying it for years, you know, my city council member, she always says, uh, you know, horrible things about me that I don't like the police. Well, but I wonder, I hope all these people are listening to what people have to say, because what these cops are doing is they're taking the easy way out. It's easy to give a traffic citation. It's easy to give an open container citation. It's easy to shove around poor children and adults that are mentally retarded or have disabilities, it's easy to, to shove somebody around who's an epileptic, okay? That's what they do because it's easy. And this, it's disgusting what they do. When it comes to calling, for, uh, calling them to come out for real crime, man, they, they drag their feet. They don't wanna have to do it because they don't wanna have to do real work. It's too hard for them. And they're too good because they make a lot of money these guys and women, you know, and all the brass that make $600,000 a year sitting at a desk, desk somewhere doing banker's hours. Why real crime is happening between midnight and six people, people breaking into houses and stealing cars. My car was stolen. No, but they didn't care. They could care less. They don't, they don't 
They just want to do as little as possible, and they don't want to have to do real police work. They'd rather shove around law-abiding c- citizens that maybe cr- you know created some infraction while driving or jaywalking or whatever or, or hassling people walking down the street who are minding their own business. They need midnight to six patrols when the real crime is happening. And the only thing you ever hear them uh, talk about is how they busted a guy with a gun and marijuana. Well, as far as I'm concerned, marijuana, I guess, now is legal. But they are the ones who regulate it. They are the ones who tax. Liz Sonjin? Hi, uh, my name is Liz Sonjin. I'm a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice at Sacred Heart. I'm a voter in District 3, and I urge you to protect this process against getting watered down. Um, I've participated in training with the SJPD as a sexual assault crisis counselor, and I'm here to tell you that it's not enough. For me, the Derek Sanderlin incident last year was emblematic of the wider problem that we face. We can advise and train our cops all we want, but unless they know that they'll face consequences for misconduct, my neighbors will keep paying the price. So now is really the time to make some real change. We support the recommendation of a community commissioner with uh, investigatory power, power over hiring, firing, and promotions, and power over policy and procedures, an independent investigation department for to replace uh, internal affairs and inspector general are essential to being able to actually give this commission and to make real changes to give them teeth. Um, and I guess I fear that unless we make the strongest possible recommendations, we're going to wind up with an end product that only pays lip service to protecting our community. Thank you. Corey. Hi, my name is Corey Lawrence and I'm a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice at Sacred Heart and I'm a voter in District 2. After I observed overly aggressive and intimidating tactics by the San Jose Police Department in May 2020 during the George Floyd protests in downtown San Jose, after which I ended up with bruises and a healthy fear of the police, I filed a report online with the IPA. Over a year later, I have received zero acknowledgement of my complaint. I still think about the moment I realized how dangerous this line of heavily armed and armored men were and how unprotected I felt standing in Cesar Chavez Plaza in peaceful protest. We believe the time is now for community oversight to be part of the city's charter that includes the ability to investigate, hire and fire, and speak to police procedure and protocols. We support the proposal recommending an inspector general, an oversight committee, and independent office of investigation. Thank you. Kim Guptil. Yes, my name is Kim Guptil, and I'm also a member of Showing Up for Racial Justice at Sacred Heart and a D6 resident. I grew up thinking that the police were my friends and that they would help me in a crisis, and that's because I'm white. We know that this isn't true for our black and brown relatives and friends, as well as our special needs community members. It's unconscionable that the San Jose has neither a police commission nor an inspector general. Our police can and do do whatever they like with minimal consequences to themselves, but devastating ones for our communities of color and disability. This is a no brainer. We believe the time is now for community oversight to be part of the city charter. We support the recommendation of a community commission with investigatory power, power over hiring, firing and promotions, and power over policy and procedures. An independent investigations department to replace internal affairs and an inspector general. It's way past time for the city of San Jose to do the right thing here. Thank you. Samina Usman. 
Yes, hello, my name is Samina Usman. I am the Senior Government Relations Coordinator for the Council on American Islamic Relations, and I'm also a board member for Sacred Heart. I'm really um, disappointed that we have still do not have an independent um, auditor for the police, that we do not have like a working police commission. Um, it, you know, this is, it's so critical, um, especially, I mean, you were hearing from um, testimony after testimony from families who've been impacted by police violence, and yet, um, there, there's like almost nothing that's done in order to, to remedy this. Obviously, the current system is not working. The current system is broken, you know, and we're going to continue to see, um, you know, innocent lives lost. We're going to continue to see millions of dollars being paid out, um, you know, in, in lawsuits and whatnot, um, when it could be going in order to support our, our communities. You know, uh, what does um, the police have to be, uh, I, mean, I mean, like in terms of, you know, we should be able to have a community um, involvement when it comes to making these decisions. You know, if the police was doing everything perfect, what do they have to be afraid of? Obviously, the, the, the reasons why there's such pushback about this is because there's a problem. And that's why there's even more of a need for us to be um, having such an oversight body like this. It's worked in Oakland. I've worked with a lot of, you know, I've worked with the, the Oakland Police Commission. Um, I, I've, I've worked with members over there and it's important for the community to have a say um, in what's going on. So please, um, you know, I, I urge you to, to support this uh, measure. Thank you. Jose Rodriguez. Eh, buenos días. ¿Qué me oyen? Yes. Eh, sí, buenos días a todos y a todas. Este, soy un, um, una persona eh, eh, aquí en San José, tengo 20 años de, de ¿cómo se llama? De, 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 en esta ciudad y yo soy una persona discapacitada y quisiera... Eh, ser, estar seguro más que nada aquí dentro de la comunidad. Eh, en mi familia, um, eh, más que nada por mi familia y todo eso. Entonces, la verdad, este, me gustaría que el jefe de policía eh, fuese elegido democráticamente por la, el consejo de la ciudad, no por la administración. Queremos que tener una relación directa con el, el jefe de policía. Estamos, este, um, eh, la verdad, yo he visto muchas injusticias. Ah, eh, ah. Más que nada, eh, mi miedo es porque este, ah, soy una persona discapacitada y, y, y ah, ando en las calles y todo eso y, y veo mucha, mucha este, por parte de la policía, mucha fuerza este, eh, eh, por parte de ellos. Ah, más que nada, que, este, como esa, uh, fuerza de, uh, de, de poder que tienen. Y yo, la verdad, honestamente, en, dentro de la comunidad no me siento tan seguro. Gracias. Alina. Good morning, commissioners. Um, thank you to our presenters. Uh, what I would like to share this morning um, and remind is that the city charter, our city constitution, is a document that belongs to the people of San Jose, and it can only be amended by the vote of the people of San Jose. The mayor, council, city staff, still with community input, are then in charge of the policies and codes and ordinances that are meant to uphold and implement the will of the people, this document. Therefore, this document is of utmost importance, and it sets the tone and values and direction for our elected officials, the mayor and council and city staff, and the will of the people have been speaking for a really long time and for the first time since 1986 they, are, they have been given an opportunity to change and update this document in collaboration with fellow residents every person here that's been appointed to this commission your job is to listen and steward the process on behalf of not just your district but for all people of san jose and people have been asking for reforms to our public safety infrastructure for a really long time they have been following and engaging in every forum offered to them and following the procedures and process and they deserve to finally be heard. And so I hope that you are all able to have the courage and the bravery into carrying these uh, issues forward and these proposals and advocating for them. 
and um, I thank you all for your tireless service this morning. And um, I look forward to hearing from other speakers and the other proposals th this morning. Thank you. Megan Swift. Hello, my name is Megan Swift and I'm a member of Surge and I vote in District 4. Um, I, I was injured by San Jose Police Department at the George Floyd protests, beat and arrested while peacefully protesting. I filed a complaint with the OIPA and six weeks later received a response from Chief Garcia that they were conducting an investigation. A letter from the man who oversaw and who was responsible for training the officers who hurt me and no response since September 22nd, 2020. This is not oversight. San Jose is a city that leads, yet it uses an outdated system that compromises community safety and trust. San Jose Police Department's duty is to protect and serve, yet there is a grossly inadequate system for formal public input. And this is an injustice and a disservice to our community. I was out with my 15 year old daughter a few weeks ago and saw a domestic dispute that involved a nasty verbal conflict. And it escalated to the woman pulling a pellet gun, shooting it. Um, it you know didn't have bullets thank god but the man he punched her in the face and i sat there with my daughter with no one to call i couldn't call the police because i couldn't be sure that by making that call i would be complicit in one or both of them being murdered or imprisoned and, and damaged beyond what they were already struggling with so I believe that the time is now for us to change our community oversight. My family and my community support the proposal recommending an inspector general, an oversight committee and an independent office of investigation. This is on you to vote and to make this happen. Thank you for your time. Maria Marcello. Sí, buenos días. Uh, yo en lo personal soy uh, directora de la clínica de Healing Group y en, es, para mí es bien importante saber que toda la comunidad se sienta segura. Parte de eso estamos viendo de que hicimos las encuestas y muchas personas desean realmente que los policías tengan de, uh, el mando directo de los concejales, no de la administradora de la ciudad. Esa es una. Otra de las cosas para mí es bien importante también que tomemos en cuenta que el departamento de policías es grandísimo y que los que están fallando más en realidad es el departamento de detectives que nunca investigan antes de hacer las cosas. A mí me ha tocado que nos han parado el policía del ticket y nos refiere con el detective. El detective nunca se aparece. Entonces... Debería de haber algún sistema para poder trabajar directamente con los detectives y que alguien asegure que realmente hagan su trabajo. Y aparte, el departamento de la policía, que sabemos que ellos tratan de hacer, pero también nosotros como comunidad tenemos que trabajar ayudando a que no provoquemos más problemas. Porque por desgracia también señalamos y no cumplimos. Así que es importante que tanto los oficiales de la ciudad los detectives y la comunidad trabajemos en equipo. Y uh, otra de las cosas que habíamos visto en las investigaciones era que queríamos que las personas estuvieran, uh, que se quedara la mesa directiva tal y como está trabajando ahorita. Gracias. Jala Robinson. Hi, uh, so my name is Jala Robinson. Uh, I'm a member of Rex, the Race, Equity and Community Safety uh, Committee, and I'm a voter in District 3. Um, earlier, Ms. Asher told us about dialogue she had with the use of force trainer for the SJPD, where they trained to assume that a person not making eye contact is considering running. My nephew is profoundly autistic. He's nonverbal, um, and so he doesn't make eye contact. Um, and that was a gut punch as I pictured what might happen if he were ever in this, such a situation. 
um, because it, it has happened before to other people with autism. It is obscene that officers are free to commit acts of violence with no formal outside oversight. And we know based on history and recent events that the police will not police themselves. Apparently they won't even take the time to educate themselves about the needs of the community that they supposedly serve. As a city, it is on us to take this power to administer oversight. And so it is time to be for community oversight to be part of the city's charter that includes the ability to investigate, hire, and fire, and speak to police procedure and protocols. Um, so I support the proposal recommending an inspector general, an oversight committee, and an independent office of investigation. Thank you. Jocelyn Cardona. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Jocelyn Cardona and I am a voter in District 6. Um, having been raised in San Jose and in this county, I've been envisioning for too long a place where the dignity of all, especially our Black, Indigenous community, LGBTQ plus community, and our community with disabilities is upheld. Accountability is important in re-envisioning public safety. And I cannot imagine us continuing to have the current system we uphold in a city that I love. Having community voice centered should not be worrisome, instead it should be celebrated. It is not okay to be how we are now, and it must change. We cannot continue to be complicit in creating more pain and injustice by doing nothing we are complicit. We as a community cannot continue to perpetuate a system of safety that we see has damaged the fabric of communities of color, has divided us, and that perpetuates harm. And we can be a model for change. Um, I believe this is uh, the time is now for community oversight to be a part of the city charter. That includes the ability to investigate, hire and fire, and speak to the police procedure and protocols. So I support also the proposal recommending on an inspector general, an oversight committee, and an independent office of investigation. Thank you. Elizabeth AJ. Hi everyone, my name is Elizabeth and um, I live in District 3 and I'm a part of Sacred Hearts Race, Equity and Community Safety uh, Committee. Um, and I'm half, um, oh actually, yeah, I'm half black and half Latina. I have always grown up with the fear of the police and taught to be weary and um, weary when interacting with the police and for good reason. My father as a child of 14 years old was undocumented and him and his cousin were taking taken from a predominantly Latino community into the Oakland Hills and beat and left there. I've constantly seen the police harassing and assaulting black and brown people in my community. At the age of 11, two officers pointed their guns at me and my sister trying to go to school. Not to mention the numerous lives of black men, women, and trans folks who are killed every year by the police with no justice. And in San Jose, knowing how so many people with mental illness are killed um, by the police. It is unrealistic to ever expect communities of color, folks with mental illness like myself, or folks with disability to ever trust the police unless the community has direct involvement. We believe now is the time to uh, for community oversight to be a part of the city's charter that includes the ability to investigate, hire, and fire um, and speak to police procedures and protocols. We support the proposal recommending an inspector general, an oversight committee, and independent officer of investigation. Lever Foster. Good morning, and thank you to our presenters. My name is Lavere Foster, and I represent the African American Community Service Agency. And I'm also a member of Reimagining Public Safety Committee. I fully support uh, the recommendation of a police oversight commission. I've had conversations with people in our community, uh, people who are either impacted by actions of the police or have loved ones who are. And they agree uh, community police oversight is necessary. It is a privilege to live your life and not have to worry if something bad will happen to you if you call the police. Not everyone has that privilege. I encourage you to take a step back and pay attention to what our community is saying. We have to all act as one community on this issue. Please support the recommendation for the Police Oversight Commission. Thank you. Cecilio Villafana.
Cecilio. Calling one last time, Cecilio via Fauna. Okay, I'm gonna move on to Carmen B. Hi, I'm Carmen Brammer and a voter in District 8. I'm a member of the Black Leadership Kitchen Cabinet and also the Racial Equity Action Leadership Real Coalition. And this matters to me personally as someone who is of African, African ancestry descent, I am concerned that there's a disparate focus on my community. We represent only 3% of the population. And one of the statistics I'll prove in the interest of, I'll share in the interest of time is, yet we're two times as likely to be pulled over by the San Jose Police Department and given a local infraction as a result of a non-traffic stop. And this matters to me because our police department is here to protect and serve all citizens in San Jose without regard to race. It's critical to remind officers and their leadership that serve S-E-R-V-E, -E, the top priority for their role. It's long past time for community oversight to be a part of the city's charter and include the ability to investigate, hire, fire, and speak to police procedures and protocols. I support recommending an inspector general, an oversight committee, and an independent office of investigation. Thank you. Aisha Tyler. Good morning. My name is Maisha Taylor, and I serve as a program manager at the African American Community Services Agency on 6th Street in San Jose. First, giving uh, respect to those who have demonstrated the trauma that has been perpetuated by those officers who are directly responsible for promoting fear in our communities. Santa Clara County and the city of San Jose has the responsibility to protect all citizens with the lens of a layered responsibility of accountability as well of our black, brown and indigenous community members. A suggestion is to have an oversight committee to create a checks and balance system to those officers who do not abide by their oath to protect the citizens and especially those children and those who have uh, certain disabilities that enable them to not have a voice or the physical ability to do what is requested by certain police officers. I believe that everybody has the right to experience safety. I believe that every man, woman, child has the ability and right to, for an adult to drive down the street and not have their heart beating out of their chest as soon as they see a police officer. That is not America. That is not what we have uh, wanted to build in our communities. Bring community leaders to the table to discuss direct impacts that happen. Uh, also creating a database where we keep track of all, all community members who call in with reports so that we can be accountable as uh, in real time as to what is happening with our community members to address these issues directly. I am in favor of creating a uh, policy. I am in favor of creating a new system. Sigurd Jacobson. Sigurd. There should, Sigurd Jacobson. Okay, I'm gonna move on to Kiana Munoz. Hello, thank you for this time. My name is Kiana Munoz and I am also a member of the Reimagining Public Safety Steering Committee. Today, I will be representing the African American Community Service Agency. 
I believe that community safety is one of the most important issues within our city. When taking a look at the past protests and rallies that have taken place in our community, we have heard the stories of police brutality that took place. If we are to truly say that community safety is top priority, then these stories should not go without change. This committee can be the start of showing the people of San Jose that its city cares about them. This committee wants to help the city protect its people in the way that is good for them. I would like to emphasize the word them because we must understand that policing needs to be tolerated and it needs to be tailored to each community. I support the proposal to create a community policing oversight committee. The time is now for our community to come together and to create much needed change with the benefits everyone involved. Milan. Good afternoon and thank you to uh, you all present. Alone, the tears are proof and it represents that humanity is in pain. As a representative of people, I am a voter in District 7 and the executive director here at the African American Community Service Agency. We hear the cries of the community, we hear the stories, and we are here to not ask but demand support for this proposal. Like all employees, there is oversight in all of our jobs. Yet in this field of public safety, to protect the public, we are begging for such oversight. This should not be. We need change now for oversight, new structure, credibility, and legitimacy. In the proposal, we are asking for the Inspector General an independent office of investigation and for police oversight commission with the ability to investigate these incidents of police violence, to hiring, firing, and disciplining officers for misconduct. We ask this commission to listen to every story you have heard and make this happen today. Steph Hansen Quintana. Steph? Good morning. Good morning, can you hear me? Yes. Um, good morning. My name is Steph Hansen Quintana and I'm the director for organizing and policy at Sacred Heart Community Service. Um, for many generations for too long, um, Black and Indigenous and communities of colors have been grappling with the death dealing force of racism and sometimes perpetuated um, by institutions like the police. And we really need like this moment, this historical moment here in our community and across everywhere else is really asking us to reimagine what keeping each other safe looks like to reimagine what safety looks like in our community. And like, we must really stand to that task um, in our city, in this community here and make sure that we are creating um, systems of safety that are truly preserving and uplifting the dignity of all of our community members. For that reason, we believe that it's time that the time is now for community oversight to be part of the city charter that includes the ability to investigate, hire and fire, and speak to police procedures and protocols. We support the proposal recommending an inspector general and an oversight committee and independent office of investigation. Um, we really need to get this done and we need to do it now. Thank you. Sigurd Jacobson. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm Sigurd Jacobson. I am a member of Surge. I live in Santa Clara, um, not in San Jose. Um, and as a, a white person, I do not have direct experience of police abuse. Um, so I'm here today out of solidarity with all those who have been traumatized and abused by use of police force. Um, my husband was born and raised in Germany. Um, always <laughs> for him, the police is a friend and protector. Um, when he immigrated here, I, I witnessed his eventual realization that here in the United States, police and the public live in fear of one another. Um, and I share my husband's shock as we watch over and over 
in different parts of the country in our community that as police power is abused. Um, I, I think things can be different. I know things can be different. Um, it's important, I think, to really imagine what collaboration would look like from all parties in the community. And I think I want to say it's in all of our interests. This is not working for the police either. So um, what we have is not working for anyone. And if we agree that change is needed, then we can't continue to do the same thing and expect different results. So I think if we could see change in the charter in San Jose, that would be hope for everyone in the wider Silicon Valley um, to, to anybody who cares about justice. So I strongly support the proposal to recommend um, oversight committee and independent investigation. Thank you. Back to the chair. Thank you, and thank you to our guests from Reim, the members of the committee from Reimagine, but thank you to the public for all of your comments, uh, your thoughtfulness and your uh, presence here today. Uh, trust me, it's very much appreciated by the commission and considered very seriously by the commissioners. Um, this morning, I'm now going to open our public hearing um, or this afternoon, and um, let me walk through just our procedures that we're gonna be using this afternoon. Um, the subcommittee on the, um, that is presenting today will present two sets of recommendations um, initially. They will be given eight minutes per, um, recommend, uh, per topic area of recommendation. And, and I will be keeping time today so that we can allow the public to be able to speak on these issues. So I know commissioners are gonna be really focusing on the recommendation itself. Um, we will then open to the public comment on each of those uh, sets those those two recommendations each, um, and so I will call them out as the two that are coming together and introduce the two uh, commissioners that will be presenting. We will walk through this entire procedure um, by going uh, two by two by pairs all the way through. There are eleven different sets of recommendations, so um, there there is a a, a a real point to timeliness here, so that the public can weigh in on the topic that they may be here for. Uh, an important one. So let's get started. Our first one is, uh, the first set is going to be Article 10, which is Boards and Commissions Reform. Um, that This is gonna be presented by Commissioner Amador. Um, and secondly, the Native Land Acknowledgement Commissioner uh, Commission would also be uh, Commissioner Segura. Uh, Commissioner Amador. Chair, I think there was a question from Commissioner Fuentes. Commissioner Fuentes. I'm, I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to introduce our uh, presentation, if it's, that's okay. I'm sorry, which presentation? Uh, our in, entire uh, presentation. Entire body, yeah, thank you, yes, okay. Okay, okay thank you. Um, my name is Maria Fuentes. I'm one of the uh, members of the Policing, Municipal Law, Accountability and Inclusion Subcommittee. And I want to welcome everyone that's here uh, from the public, especially and other commissioners as well. And um, I, I just want to say that um, what you are about to hear are presentations from a group of people who worked very hard for months to try and and get us ready for the future. Um, you know, we always say that we want to leave the world better for our children and our grandchildren. So all the topics that you will hear today is all about that. And um, with that in mind, I, I don't wanna take any more time, but we really wanna thank you for being here. And we want you to know that our goal is to, to really create a better community for everyone in our city. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Fuentes. Commissioner Amador. Great, thank you. And I will be sharing my screen. Um, Okay, thank you one more time. My name is Veronica Amador, um, and I will be talking about the proposed um, article amendments on Article 10 uh, for the Charger, uh, Boards and Commission. And this was originally drafted by um, Elena Yen with input from community, as well as um, Commissioner Magnolia Siegel, Rick Callender, Sherry Segura, Jenny Sao, and Commissioner Maria Fuentes. Um, and so, Again, what are the problems that we're trying to address? This proposal seeks to improve accountability, representation, and inclusion under a racial equity lens with boards and commissions at the city of San Jose for council. The Charter Review Commission has 
being asked tasked with the following detective uh, directives, specifically the following directives pertaining to the commission's work, and that is five, consider additional measures and potential charter amendments as needed that will improve accountability, representation, and inclusion at City Hall. Um, as we look at how is this a burden of proof, we uh, know that according to data gathered from the last uh, three years by the city clerk office of san jose the representation across boards and commissions are not representative of the population demographic of the city of san jose as we see here on the powerpoint as well some highlights of that data and who is being represented let's focus on the planning commission for example the flea market redevelopment and rezoning that was decided in early 2000s by people who most likely had no lived experience on displacement and gentrification the plans and this is a quote from spotlight uh, the plans for the proposed urban village would shut down two-thirds of vendors because of the market's reduced size without plans to protect or relocate the flea market vendors who depend on it as main source of income would be displaced and left without employment, end quote. That would, what would this have looked like if there was more representation on boards and commissions from our historically marginalized communities, such as our immigrant and our undocumented community members? Representations by those with live experiences have hardships. For example, displacements, gentrification. Uh, gentrification means that those individuals will be able to spot and look at Sorry. On notice, on notice uh, and settled by those who have not faced any impacts with what is less than acceptable of what is needed to survive it in one of the most expensive places to live in the country. While we cannot undo the past, now is the time to course correct and prevent further community harm to our historically underrepresented communities. Um, in Article 10, Boards and Commissions, we are proposing changes in three of the following sections. Section 1000, which is 1000, Planning Commission, Section 1002, Other Boards and Commissions, and Section 1003, Reimbursements for Expenses. Uh, the Section 1000, Planning Commissions, we uh, are seeking to remove citizenship requirements, item A and B, to align with Senate Bill 225, update state guidelines on equity and inclusion for government boards and commissions. This is something that was passed back in October of 2019 by government Newsom. And do we see, are there any examples of this? Yes, there are many of these examples uh, and changes across the country and the state of California. For example, most recently, the city of Santa Ana and Costa Mesa have updated their boards and commission membership requirements to remove this bar barriers to civic participation. And is this something feasible? Yes, it is an amendment to membership requirement and does not have fiscal impacts or impacts on implementation, current operation staff time. And section 1000 planning commission um, the next thing is adding a new section that incorporates racial and social equity analysis to promote the use of an equity lens for planning and equity lens is a tool used to improve planning decisions making and resource allocation leading to more racially equitable policies and programs for any policy or project decision maker could consider structural equity procedural equity distribution equity and transgenerational equity are there any examples of this? Um, and like I mentioned before, yes, there are examples of this. The city of Baltimore policies of incorporating as a racial equity lens into their entire planning department. So it is very feasible and it is something that we can start implementing as soon as possible. Um, and is, again, one more time, is this feasible? Yes, this could be an evaluation survey or form for the planning commission in partnership with a faith approach with appropriate departments such as, but not limited to the Office of Racial Equity, following cities like Baltimore, GARE, and the American Planning Association Equity and Policy Guidelines. Um, the next section, uh, the second one would be section 1002, other boards and commissions, and this would be adding a new section, one, uh, a would be training and education. All boards and commission members are subject to training that addresses gender, racial, and social equity and relate its civic education as required, such as the Brown Act, Rosenberg, Roberts Rules of Order. And B, chair and vice chair selection. All board commissions and committees should have a chair and vice chair democratically selected through a vote of majority of members of said board commission or committee. Um, 
and section 1002 other boards and commissions um, are there any is this are there other examples of this change and is this feasible and what we're proposing it is feasible and there are um, other changes of this as well um, Training and education. Currently, training and education is provided on ethics and sexual harassment and the Brown Act and Sunshine rules via video. And the chair and vice chair selection, yes, most commission, unless otherwise stipulated, democratically nominate and select their chair and vice chair through a majority of vote of members on said boards, commissions, and committees. Um, the next section is uh, amendment would be 1003 reimbursements for expenses. Um, and this should be all members of boards and commissions and committees shall receive a stipend to remove any social economic barriers to civic participation within boards and commission. Um, are there any other examples of this? And is this feasible? Yes, there are other examples. Other boards and commissions do have some um, kind of stipend by monthly, as we can see here in one of the pictures, we're looking at the planning commission, which gets a stipend of $250 a month. Um, and again, others do not, um, such as the San Jose Charter Commission, we do not get any stipend. Um, this does prevent a lot of people from actually trying to participate and you know not being compensated for their experience expertise and their time um, we do defer compensation advisory committees voluntary employees beneficiary association advisory committees um, are reimbursed only uh, and what are the arguments against this proposal one there is no budget available to support this work it will cost taxpayers too much money two the city of san jose does not have a diversity and racial equity problem and three there's not enough data available that can ensure equitable outcomes as we know, on number on the number one, um, it, there is no budget available to support this work, and it will cost a lot of money. When we think about uh, improving social and racial equity, it will require some equity to be invested into our community. This investment is also supported by the most recent mayor budget message on spending proposal selection, section A, equity and racial justice. Argument two, the city of San Jose does not have a diversity and a racial equity. As the data gathered and collected by the city clerk office on boards and commissions, there is a clear evidence of lack of diversity and representation and directed impact on low income and communities of color. And the argument number three, there is not enough data available that can ensure equitable outcomes. While there is not as much data documenting long-term impacts that ensure more equitable outcomes, there is a lot of proof that we have now that it isn't working. Equity is defined as just as fair inclusion into a society in which all can participate, prosper, and reach their full potential, unlocking the promise of the nation by unleashing the promise in us all. And this is a quote from the American Planning Association. These changes will benefit all of the people of San Jose, not right away or all at once, but over time. The burden on change weights on everyone. All participants, both those on the city, staff and residents stepping into a familiar environment roles to create sustainable and long lasting change for our city and communities that improve social and racial equity, accountability and inclusion. We're all humans and deserving of life, joy, safety, shelter and sustenance. As a member of this community, we're all responsible for the care that goes into building community and meaningful con connection and for future generations. And one more time, the time is now. We have this opportunity that we didn't have, that we haven't had for 35 years. And I ask you all to please um, act on it as it is now. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Amador. Commissioner Segura. Thank you. I'm sharing my screen now. Sorry about that. Can you see that? Wonderful. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sherry Segura. I am uh, presenting this on behalf of my subcommittee, which also includes Magnolia, Se or Commissioner Magnolia Siegel, um, Rick Callender, Veronica Amador, uh, and Jenny Zhao. <clears throat> what is the problem um, that causes us to need a land acknowledgement in our charter petition? Um, we had two different, um, you know, speakers come and speak on behalf, actually we had four in total, but two different presentations um, so that we could really elicit some information and find out what these problems are. 
The secularization of the Bay Area has caused harm to indigenous people. And the word secularization came up in the last meeting. Um, the way we're using it here is essentially when a religious social um, loses social and cultural significance. Uh, taking and not returning land um, occupied by tribes, past government policies that exterminated native language, cultural practices and religious rights and causing trauma to generations of native people. The loss of their native, their native language, um, I'm sorry, the loss of their native land and lack of acknowledgement continues to cause harm. Why a charter revision? Including this in our charter is the, of the utmost importance to our native community. It is the first step to healing the community by acknowledging it's important to the Mwekma Ohlone tribe and other indigenous people. Benefits. Um, a native land acknowledgement will support the healing of gen uh, generations of trauma and promote them in finding their voice in the conversation of where and how they fit into the diverse community of the Bay Area. Land acknowledgements are very important for the healing process. They recognize the existence of Native people, not only that they were here in some distant past, but rather they are alive and thriving. The Moekma Ohlone people are stewards of their ancestral land, preserving their connections from the past to future generations. This acknowledgement will also recognize and show appreciation for the contributions their ancestors have made in our shared history. Feasibility. This is, to our knowledge, becoming a common practice in many places in California and the rest of the country. We are not aware of any law prohibiting such an acknowledgement and uh, hopefully we'll hear um, that uh, seconded by our legal counsel, um, Mark Fanny. There's some other local examples. There's a condensed version acknowledgement spoken in the city of San Jose, um, San Jose State University, California College of the Arts, San Francisco State University, Centers for Educational Justice and Community, Oakland University, ACLU of Northern California, and other examples. <clears throat> Our recommendation uh, is we are proposing that the land rights acknowledgement be formally included in the charter we, the Mwekma Ohlone people shared two versions. Uh, our recommendation is for the longer, but uh, if they're the full version, if we weren't able to for any reason, they also submitted a short version. The short version is one page, as you can see here, and these were all submitted so that the public can um, have access to them. And the full version is actually two pages here. I really hope that uh, you vote in favor of this. Um, I think we've, we've seen here today that there's <clears throat> quite a bit of healing that needs to occur in our city. And I truly hope that this is something that we can all agree is, um, is needed. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Segura. Um, thank you, Commissioner Amador. Those two items are recommendations being made to the commission. We'll now go to the public and ask the public to weigh in on either or both of these two items and, and ask folks to focus, let us know which one you're speaking to uh, in your comments. Thank you. And I'll ask the clerk for this first speaker. Tessa Woodmancy. Uh, yes, well, thank you so much. Well, I, I really enjoyed that speech about, you know, land and, and you know, the whole thing with the Ohlone's and the indigenous land. And like I was saying in my work um, with the climate crisis is that the female, which in the, um, in the indigenous um, cultures of the Ohlone and all the indigenous Native Americans, indigenous cultures all over, it was matriarchal. And that's the change that, that we've gone through is that we've become patriarchal and, uh, you know, and we, we suppressed, you know, we killed them. We took their heads and, you know, we just, you know, we, we made capitalism and consumerism out of, you know, which is exploiting people and nature for profit. And that's been the change in our culture is going from matriarchal that cares for life and living things to making money. And money is the root of all evil. And so we have to reclaim the lands. We have to go back to the indigenous ways. That was what the whole hippie generation was about was you know, in, in, incorporating the native, the native people, the Native Americans and, and their lifestyles. 
And as we, you know, that's what we need to go back to. And if we're going to survive as a species, and already so many of our, our species, especially in the global south, are, are suffering the droughts in Madagascar, where there's no food. I mean, that's the reality, you know, and, and we look at our lives and, and these people are suffering with no food, you know, because of the droughts that they're experiencing in southern Madagascar. And so, you know, and that, that, was the, that was the birthplace of humanity, Africa. It's an island off of Africa with such rich biodiversity. And we've destroyed it. This is, what, this is what we've done in our patriarchal ways. And we have to go back to caring for life and living things. And that's, you know, we have to have, that's the change. That's a transformational change we need. And we need land to grow food. That's what we need to start doing everywhere. Victor Sin. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Victor Sin. I'm a resident of San Jose and the chair of the Santa Clara Valley chapter of the ACLU of Northern California. I'm going to comment on both recommendations. We commend suggested changes that help level the playing field for entry into public service. We welcome the proposed change so that citizenship is no longer an eligibility requirement for the members of the planning commission so as to make the membership more inclusive. I noticed that in the PowerPoint presentation, the proposed change to section 1000 is to remove items A and C. However, in the PDF document, it says to remove items A and B. I just want to point out the typo. Regarding land acknowledgement, land acknowledgement can serve as a first and important introductory step into indigenous justice. To that end, we support draft recommendation three, but I would like to point out that land acknowledgement is just that, an acknowledgement and first step. We encourage the city to work alongside indigenous peoples and following their lead as they work to uphold their sovereignty, dignity, and identities. Thank you. Paul Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. I, I speak now as a member of the Kumye Nation, and they are the peoples that built the Mission San Diego, which is the first mission of the 21 built by Unipero Serra. So I have a relationship to, to, to that history. I have the documentation for it. Quote, our nation was born in genocide. We are perhaps the only nation which tried as a matter of national policy to wipe out its indigenous population. Moreover, we elevated that tragic experience into a noble crusade. Indeed, even today, we have not permitted ourselves to reject or feel remorse for this shameful episode. So the question that I pose to, to, to us as a city today, anybody that's listening, if this is legitimate, and we all agree that this happened, we shouldn't have to ask the question is, why is it that this is a debatable issue? When we can answer that basic question, then we will be revealed, and hopefully some of us will have some humility to accept it. Our own selves will be revealed. So this is, this is where we're at now. We're, we're not, we're not going to tolerate the fact that we're going to put our histories on the line. And it's going to be subject to whether or not Tom McHenry agrees with it or not. I challenge Tom McHenry to a debate. I'll bring my stuff, you bring yours. And we'll have creativity uh, televise it because he's talking in the newspaper today and saying that all of the decapitations that happened in this area are lies. He's saying that they're flat out lies. Okay. And so I challenge him because this is critically important to write these histories and the tragedy that Masonic Lodge 10 brought to Willow Glen and the redlining policies we have to deal with. Call in user two. Okay, could you imagine if we could trace back the native land where City Hall is? That would be interesting. Maybe uh, City Hall could be taken away and taken over back by the Ohlone's. How, how, how would that be? Probably put a casino there. That'd be really funny. That'd be really funny watching the city council and Sam Licardo walked out of their own offices as they make these policies. But uh, I really do think 
that there should be more recognition and historical information about the tribes that lived here for millenniums, really. Uh, they knew how to prevent flooding, control fires. As you can see, we don't know how to do that as modern day uh, European people still uh, like uh, they're picking prunes here or something. I don't know. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of things we could learn from what the people who originally were here. And I think we should get rid of the Keys and Kotal statue and put something commemorating the Ohlone Indians because those are the people. Keys and Kotal, great, but we're not Mexico. And the Keys and Kotal is from Mexico City and Aztec culture, which is fine, but it's not San Jose culture. And I think that uh, having... Uh, once again, commemorating the Ohlone Indians with a nice statue and plaque commemorating what they did for millenniums here in this area would be something really cool for everyone to see and talk about versus having Keys and Kotal, which looks like a pile of dumb, really. I hate to say it, but look, the kids would crack me up when they climb on top and they say, Mom, 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 look, I'm standing on a pile of shit. It, it's hilarious to watch them do that. But at the same time, uh, it's not a very beautiful statue. It costs over $600,000, complete waste of money about 30 years ago. Once again, we need to commemorate the Native people. Dave W. Yes, I'm, I'm uh, commenting on Article 10, and I'm very concerned about uh, what was presented to this. Um, you're using a lot of key words that have been included in critical race theory, which has been taught in our schools, indoctrinating our kids for a system that is doomed for failure. When you say equity, uh, excuse me, uh, racial uh, equ equity lens, that implies that you are encouraging discrimination. People should be uh, on commissions and so forth based on their qualifications not to have this accurate oh we got a little bit of a percentage here we need a little bit more here a little bit less there and uh to me that is that is a horrible way to look at things it, it, we, yes we do have problems uh, that not every uh, ethnic group is equal uh you should have programs like uh helping black people with their family structure, for instance. That's one of the reasons why they have problems. I'm talking about American blacks, not people that have immigrated to this country legally from the African countries. They've been doing fine. And you should take a look at why the American blacks have problems and people have immigrated don't. I also want to address this um, non-citizens to be on these commissions. We live here, the U.S. citizens are, are living here, and it is us who should make the decisions for our country, not non-citizens. People are either here illegally um, or are here to uh, gain citizenship later on, or if they have just work visas. No, these people are temporary. The citizens of the United States should make the decisions. Do not include non-citizens. It's about time that Americans are put first, not last, like it's being done today. This is a disgrace. Carmen B. Hi, I'm Carmen Brammer, and I'm a voter in District 8. And I do agree with the fact that the commission should remove citizenship requirements from all government boards and commissions per the Senate Bill 225. By, provand, by providing expanded reimbursements and stipends, we can remove socioeconomic barriers to civic participation and maintain democratic best practices. Thank you. Milan Ballantin. Thank you. I am in support of both. As a voter in District 7, and a grandson to a lineage of Africans that were brought here, stolen and brought here. And recognizing the natives and the land that we live on, it is important that everybody notice and learns from the previous speaker uh, before Carmen that spoke all of that vitriol and incorrect information. We are all here from different places and we all need to recognize the native community and make sure that we do not spew out this kind of hate. It is just terrible. Please support both. Thank you. 
Back to the chair. Thank you. <clears throat> Our next two items. Um, first is the use of gender inclusive language on all of the city of San Jose documents. And then secondly, police commission, independent investigation department, office of inspector general. Um, this afternoon, Commissioner Amador will present the first item, uh, use of gender inclusive language. Um, could the subcommittee get clarity for me? I don't know who's the presenter of the um, police commission item. I will be today. Thank you, Commissioner Siegel. Then you'll be the second speaker. Uh, Commissioner Amador, you may begin. All right, thank you, everyone. Um, and on this next recommendation is the use of uh, gender inclusive language on all of City of San Jose documents. Um, again, this was uh, submitted by Commissioner McNally Siegel, Rick Callender, uh, Commissioner Sherry Segura, and Commissioner Jenny Zell. Um, and this proposal seeks to promote accountability, representation, and specifically inclusion under racial equity lens at the City of San Jose by promoting and supporting gender inclusive language in all of city documents. Again, this was um, something that was a directive pertaining to the Commission's work and number five. In addition, um, this recommendation aligns with the City of San Jose's newly created Office of Racial Equity in advancing system change through a citywide racial equity framework that will examine and improve San Jose internal policies, programs, and practices to eradicate any structural and or institutional racism in the city of San Jose. Um, and this includes a focus on enabling the organization at all levels and in all departments to identify ways to improve outcomes for Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and people of color, and of course the LGBTQ+. Um, and as we know, violence and discrimination born of intolerance and marginalization continue to take lives and create barriers to equity and opportunity for the LGBTQ plus people and their families. Language is also gender and plays a central role in human cognition and behavior as one of the most common mechanisms by which gender is constructed and reinforced. Some languages do not mark gender distinction systematically. Some use pronouns to distinguish between male and female and some go even farther, extending the gender distinction to inanimate nouns through a system of grammatical gender, gender language is essential as it frames the understanding of equity. Um, language is a reflection of our attitude and norms in within, within a society. It also shapes our worldview and other time people's attitude as what is normal and acceptable. The way language is used not only reflects social structures and biases, however, it may also reinforce preconceptions and inequalities related to gender roles in everyday life and the work environment. Um, we had a, a, a couple of speakers speaking on this um, in some of our, um, in some of our, uh, oh my goodness, I forgot the word, but uh, some of our speakers came and they gave us a recommendation about um, updating the gender language to be inclusive. They told, um, we were provided with a PowerPoint and that PowerPoint is available to the public as well. How many times we are using his, her, he, she, him, and that was a total of 140 times within the charger. Um, section 1704, the definition as well, the masculinity gender includes the feminine and neuter. Um, do not make gender visible when it comes to relevant for documents and communications, and update gender language can be gender inclusive or gender neutral. Um, and again, how has this been a problem or possibly benefited or burdened people? Uh, gender inclusive language in all of our city San Jose documents, this would support the written and speak in a way that does not discriminate or marginalize based on gender and does not promote or perpetuate gender stereotypes. Therefore, using gender inclusive language proactively and consistently is imperative for furthering gender equality in the workplace and creating an inclusive work environment for all staff members and as well as for community members in San Jose. Um, here are some examples of the way that we can actually start implementing. Um, and again, what are the changes that we're proposing? We're proposing this changes on section 1704 um, on the definitions, but as well as updating all of the documents of the, on the city of San Jose to have gender neutral language. Is this feasible? Yes, this is not something that will also impact monetarily as we are trying to update and it's something that can be done. Um, who might benefit? Everyone benefits from it. Must this be a charter revision? It must be a charter revision to support language inclusivity to reflect on all of San Jose City's document. Um, do we have any other examples of this? Yes, Santa Clara County has supported this effort into a policy change and has started a process in using inclusive language in all of their documents. Um, and like I mentioned before, we had 
um, our speaker, Sarah Fernando, who was a guest speaker um, who spoke to uh, the commission and community about building a more inclusive workplace and a community as well, supporting the LGBTQ+. Um, we also had other speakers supporting this, such as Bonnie uh, Sugiyama, um, and who is the director of Pride Center and Gender Equity Center at San Jose State University. We also had Stephanie Jane and Sabrina Parra, Parra Garcia at San Jose Office of Racial Equity, who came and spoke to us about those, um, the way in that they're trying to build that inclusivity as well within the racial, uh, within the San Jose Office of Racial Equity for the communities. And we also had Elena Yen, a San Jose resident representing data on boards and commissions, um, who also spoke about this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Amador, Commissioner Siegel. Commissioner Siegel, you're on mute. Can you see my screen share? Yes, we can. Thank okay. you. So um, this has to do with the police reform, oversight reform uh, that we have, um, that we are proposing. We have worked with the community in coming up with these proposals. And so this PowerPoint is to explain it. But if you go to the YouTube on um, Monday, Monday's YouTube, I spend about 26 minutes explaining it. Here I only have eight. Um, there's also the entire document called a memorandum that's on the city's website. Uh, if you go to Charter Review Commission and then you look on the website for our subcommittee on policing, you'll see 11 recommendations. One of them is this. Unfortunately, it has not been titled. I don't know why it's just numerical one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So apologies that you'll have to click each one to open that. We do think it should be um, named to make it easier for you, the public. But this is our proposal. So what's the problem? There's a history of policing practices, which has resulted in excessive, unnecessary force towards residents of San Jose, ultimately causing our citizens to distrust the police. The distrust has caused concerns regarding police hiring, training, accountability, mental health, awareness, as we've heard today, the lack of basic care for people they're sworn to protect, uh, San Jose lacks robust police oversight structure that in turn lacks credibility and legitimacy among impacted communities. We've heard from you today. This is how you are feeling. The oversight structure does not promote community empowerment and engagement and does not promote uh, prevention of systematic issues or accountability of police management. So we've heard that from you. You've, you've given your complaints a year later nothing has come up. You, you, we heard testimony that somebody actually got bruised, made a complaint, and didn't hear anything about it from the independent police auditor. Um, so citizen groups in San Jose are interested in seeking stronger community safety oversight and would like to participate in that oversight process by being on a commission that reviews police conduct, policies, practices, trainings, and other aspects they deem important to modern community safety excluding the public and decision making about the largest department in the city and about the department that exercises force and control over residents is inconsistent with procedural justice democratic norms and good governance so this and this is what you have all been saying and really this is coming from you we didn't invent this in a bubble we got your input and this is what we came up with so this is called a police commission. Lots of cities have police commissions. Los Angeles does, San Francisco does, Oakland does. And so we are the outlier. We are the big city that doesn't have a police commission. All the other big cities um, of our com comparable size, um, specifically LA, San Francisco and Oakland have police commissions. So we want one too. This is best practices. And so this is our proposal for that. The police commission would all be made up of civilians, folks that are not affiliated with the police union, not affiliated with law enforcement, haven't been police officers, aren't married to police officers, and so forth. Um, they don't have conflicts of interest that the community would recognize as a conflict of interest. They're truly just 
plain old citizens. So these folks would comprise a police commission. Um, this is, and, and that police commission would oversee the police chief and the police department, and also the office of the inspector general, which we're proposing that gets created. And then currently we have an independent auditor, but an auditor is not an investigator, right? They just audit documents of investigations that the police have done on their own and somebody audits that. So that's not an investigation. So we wanna convert that office to the independent investigations department. So on top, you see the police commission here and that police commission made up of civilians is in charge of both the police and then the two bodies on both sides that do uh, independent review, basically management audits of cases of, so we'll get into that now. So what is, um, so here's the police commission. What are they gonna be looking at? Training, patterns of practice, use of force, stop detentions, other practices, policies, procedures, management, hire, fire, appraise, chief of police, um, and the inspector general and the IDD. And so they are also gonna be recommending the SJPD budget to the city council. It's now a unified budget, right? This whole triangle functions as one budget. Um, so conduct regular monthly public hearings on department policies, rules, practices, customs, and general orders. The police commission will propose changes at its discretion or upon direction um, by adoption of a resolution of the city council, including modifications to the department's proposed changes. So you can look through that here. Um, so how is it formed? So, you know, I, I think my eight minutes are running out. So I encourage you to look at um, the November 1st YouTube video where I, I spent over 20 minutes talking about this, 25, 26. I just wanna point you to this new office we're proposing, Inspector General. What will it do? It will, um, it, will it will have subpoena authority and full and unfettered and unredacted access to the documents contained by the city department and all employees relating to the San Jose Police Department. This includes full access to anything and everything the police department's internal affairs has, as well as you know, body-worn camera, footage, recordings, transcripts, data, police reports, use of force, stop data, all of it. If, if anybody has it in the city, this person, the Office of the Inspector General should have access to it. And I will tell you, Siobhan Nuri, the current um, independent auditor does not. She gets lots of redacted papers and um, she's quite limited in her access. So, and she spoke to us. I encourage you to look that YouTube video up where she described all the limitations imposed on her um, by the collective bargaining agreement between San Jose and the police union that seriously curtails what Measure G voters voted for, that collective bargaining. So I encourage you to look at that video. Um, and so this is the that was the inspector general. It's gonna be looking at um, basically that patterns of practice, but what will the independent investigations department do? So they are going to be looking at um, uh, so they, they're gonna be looking at individual cases, right? So the IDD shall issue annual reports. It shall have sufficient status. Um, on the for, on, based on a formula relating to its caseload and number of complaints. So that they're still looking at complaints, but now they get to actually investigate. They don't just get to rely on the police department's investigations. And by the way, um, we got testimony that the people, the, the, invest, the police department's investigators, they're usually rookies. They have like four under four years of experience. That's what Siobhan Nuri has let us know. And, and then right after they do the investigations, they go right back out and work with the officers often that they investigated. So it's a lot of pressure on them to not find that the officer did anything wrong. This is based on the testimony that the current independent police auditor gave to this commission. I encourage you to look up that video. Um, so that is what, you know, that, that slide is what the, this new investigator will be doing. They will have subpoena authority. And so they can actually look at all that. Um, why San Jose needs a police commission? 
listen, you folks told us why we need a police commission. So that's it. We, we heard from you. We've drafted this up based on what you wanted. And you've come here today on your Saturday to repeat that. So basically, by, by establishing a strong modern oversight system that reflects best practices, public officials are provided the opportunity to demonstrate their desire for increased police accountability and to eliminate misconduct. And I'll just tell you, in Oakland, in Oakland, where they have a police commission, they not only try to put in really good, healthy rules, but they also do protect their officers. When COVID happened, they made sure the officers had masks. Um, they were able to do that. They were able to make sure the officers had um, vaccines when they were not at the head of the line for that. So when you have a police commission, it's not, it, it's really taking away the us and them, the you know police on one side and the people on the other. It's really the commission is looking at, at everybody as a whole and how do we make the police department have a better culture and be more accountable? And, and what are the problems in the policies that are causing such uh, violence against people with disabilities? What is that training? And, and they will provide the accountability to make sure that these problems uh, go away. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Sago. We'll now open it up to the public for comment on these two items. Again, I ask the public just for the sake of clarity that which one you're speaking to specifically, if you would like, um, and this clerk can call the first speaker. Paul Soto. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Uh, now, just principally, I agree fully with the LGBT community that, that proper and accurate language to reflect your identity in a city document is of the utmost importance because in the future when we're gone a hundred years from now and they look back at this time you are going to be identified so it's very very important but i'm going to say this i'm going to fight this as much as i possibly can until this city start recognizing the chicano community i'm it, it is offensive for this city to call me a person of color that is a disgusting term. And you people, they say it with, with a smile and think they're being proper. Color is the basis for white supremacy. Everything is based on color. I'm not brown and a black man ain't black. They only exist within our consciousness and identity if we use the white supremacist system, color. So we're actually reinforcing it and the marketers are laughing because they know that when you use that term, you are erasing and denying a people, their history. And the Chicano history, the Chicano legacy in San Juan is, is gave birth to three of the most powerful Mexican movements of the 20th century. The farm worker movement, the lowrider movement, and the Chicano movement. And you will, this city will no longer deny me that. No, it, they've done it enough. I'm tired of it. And I have a constitutionally protected right to do every single thing that I can as a citizen to ensure that the government serve me and not the governors. Tessa Woodmancy. All right, sweetheart. Thank you. Thank you, Tony, for all your hard work and for this commissioners that you're doing a great job, everybody. Thank you for your hard work. And I just wanted to comment, I guess there's two, two issues to comment on. One is the gender identification. And my, my um, feelings about that is that, um, you know, we have a lot of work to do and, and there's a lot of issues. And one of the issues that can, you know, like my husband says, he only has one issue and that's climate crisis. That's the only issue he thinks about because all other issues uh, are not even, you know, on the table if we don't figure out how to live sustainably on this planet, planet without the storms of outrageous fortune coming our way with three, you know, if right now, if we don't stay below, we're already at 1.3, I think they're saying, we're at 1.3 degrees C above pre-industrial. And so what, what we're proposing in the climate crisis charter is to really do extensive auditing of our, of our fossil fuel use so we can get our fossil fuel use down to zero, which is what the science says we have to do in the next eight years. That is a tremendous amount of work. 
And even the auditing is a tremendous amount of work. And so when we say, you know, spending the time to change the charter language so that it reflects, you know, um, you know gender equality or gender issues is really a, a minor issue when we're talking about the survival of our species. And so many of our species are threatened at this point. You know, we might, you know, we're a very wealthy nation, but there are nations in the South that, that they call it the global South that are really suffering. Plus we know throughout our whole country, there is destabilization where it's becoming uninhabitable. So we're gonna be dealing with so many issues, climate refugees and, and how, those issues, housing issues, and then how to get us down to zero. So that's where I need, we need to focus. And that's why I'm saying that we're not, not dealing with the gender issue, but dealing with our species and getting us to zero. Victor Sin. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Victor Sin. I'm a resident of San Jose and the chair of the Santa Clara Valley chapter of the ACLU of Northern California. I will comment on both recommendations. We support the use of gender inclusive language on all of the city of San Jose documents as stated in draft recommendation two. Note, however, that this is just a beginning. We encourage the city to pursue gender justice by working on many issues, such as ensuring people can live their lives free from gender-based violence and harassment, dismantling the sexism and racism that pervade our criminal justice system, and securing housing free from gender-based discrimination. Regarding drugs recommendation four, in San Jose, there is a history of policing practices, which has resulted in excessive and unnecessary force towards residents of San Jose, ultimately causing our community members to distrust the police. This distrust has caused concerns regarding police hiring, training, accountability, mental health awareness, disability awareness, and lack of basic care for the people they are sworn to protect. Our community has the right to know how policing is being conducted in our neighborhoods. Stronger and more independent oversight of law enforcement and increased tools for accountability make our communities safer. Thank you. Call in user two. Yeah, I, I think trying to replace all these words and all these documents is a big waste of time and money. It'll eventually over time, the newer documents, sure, but to go back in time, how far are we gonna go back? Quite frankly, you know, George Orwell was in the right uh, frame of mind when he wrote that book, or in the right area, about changing language. I mean, this is the first thing that totalitarian governments do, and they're doing it, and they're, they're using the transgender uh, community to do this, to control you by what you can say. I mean, if I say the term you people, oh, you can't say that. Well, you know, I guess now I can, right? Because you people down there are making a lot of bad decisions and changing the language is one of them. They're trying to do it with this whole Latinx thing. That is you're trying to change a language. It's Orwellian, it's wrong, and it's, and it's, it's totalitarian and you know it but you're masking it as this, oh, it's gonna be this nice thing the police are gonna be able to do. No, no, you know what the police need to do? They need to show up when there's, a, when there's a serious crime committed. The police need to be investigated when they do something wrong. Look how many of these officers they've hired who have done things, uh, pedophiles, money launderers, tax evaders, drug dealers, gun running, the list goes on, rape, murder, uh, false reporting, Letting, letting their own officers go on DUIs. And you're going to tell me about, about a word somewhere in a document? That's what's important? No, you know what? This is just something to do instead of actually go after real issues, right? Real issues are not what a word was written 25 years ago in some, in some document in the city of San Jose. It's a waste of time and money. Sandra Asher. 
Thank you. I'd like to speak on uh, both issues. First, to the gender inclusivity. I am fully in support of that recommendation. We know that language is fluid. We no longer speak in old English. Um, our language is ever evolving and including uh, gender neutral language in our charter makes our city more inclusive. Um, secondly, in regards to the proposed changes for the police oversight, um, Obviously, I spoke to this earlier, but I wanted to just say that the charter is the place to make those changes. Um, you guys have the power to make that change. It is the only place where we can affect that change for our city is by amending our charter to update our outdated police oversight. So I encourage you all to be bold and to support the citizens of our city by making those changes in the charter. Thank you. Back to the chair. Thank you. Uh, our next two items will be uh, equality values, equity standards, and equity assessments. And Commissioner Fuentes will be presenting. And then equity and inclusion in city programming and budgeting. And Commissioner Fuentes will also be presenting. Commissioner Fuentes. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, Lawrence, can you please put up the slides? Yes, give me one yeah. moment. Okay. So I will be um, covering these two recommendations and I want to first of all say that for the first recommendation that I'm going to be presenting, um, this presentation was actually um, developed by um, Commissioner Callender, who is not able to be here. And then I also want to mention that we received a lot of support and assistance in developing um, this recommendation from Bob Brownstein. Um, who was very helpful. And so with that, um, I will be um, I will be beginning and I, I know the slides will be going up pretty soon. So what are we trying to address? San Jose has a history of failing to achieve equity, inclusion, and social and racial justice, particularly in regard to the black, indigenous, people of color, constituencies, and low-income people. You see this in affordable housing, transportation, health care, and access to parks and green space, employment, law enforcement, assets and income, and other areas. Our city charter only addresses discrimination in employment or, uh, so we can go to, no, that's, that's the wrong one. Okay. Oh, this is, um, I'm sorry. This is, uh, this is, um, equity. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. It's okay. I'll just keep going. And yep. when you get it up, just go to slide three, I think, or actually, um, yeah, slide three. Um, but right now, um, I just wanted to explain that the city charter, um, right now only addresses discrimination in employment, or in any way someone is favored or discriminated against because of political opinions or affiliations or memberships in a lawful employee association or because of race, color, or creed. So slide three. Why does this belong in the city charter? It's easy to imagine that the equity goals could have been achieved through city council action or cultural change, but other stra strategies have been have proven inadequate. Waiting for them to register to generate substantially better and faster results condemns those who suffer inequities to another period of long indefinite delays. I mean, we feel strongly that this delay is not, is not good. To demonstrate a full commitment to equity, we must employ every major recommendation, recommendation that is available, every mechanism, and that includes a city charter. Racial equity assessments are best conducted during decision-making process to, and prior to the enacting of a new proposal. They inform decisions such like environmental, fiscal, and workplace assessments inform decisions. 
Cities like Detroit and the United Kingdom are using them successful. Next slide. Okay, these are, I'm gonna be sharing some key definitions regarding this, um, this charter amend, amendment. Racial and social equity shall mean the condition like receiving a service from the city of San Jose that could be achieved if someone, if one's group identity based on categorizations that have been, have experienced discrimination, including race, aspects of neurodiversity and sexual orientation, no longer predict in a statistical sense how one fares. Inclusion means bringing traditionally excluded individuals and our groups into the process, activities, and decision policy making in a way that shares power. Racial and social justice shall mean the systematic and proactive fair treatment of and allocation of resources for people of all races and all groups, categorizations that experience discrimination results in equitable opportunities and outcomes for all. Access shall mean the ability to lawfully impose positive or negative consequences on decision making. I think that's, that's accountability. Um, access means that you must include outreach to and communicate with constituencies likely to be affected by the proposal being assessed. Representation is ability to affect who will be making decisions that will impact a constituency and what the outcomes of decision making will be. Next slide, please. Okay, so in, in our proposal, we have um, equity standards. And I'm quickly going to go over the statements that you're seeing here on the screen. So in other words, what we're saying here is that these areas will be, per the recommendation we're, we're making, would be in the, the city charter. So the first one is safety. And safety means that live free from harm or, or threat of harm from other persons, private institutions, or city agencies as, they, as every other resident. Environmental health, living in an environment with clean air, soil, and water as every other resident. Water and sanitation, addresses having access to clean water supplies for personal and domestic use and adequate sanitation services as every other resident. Parks and recreation, having access to parks, recreational opportunities, community centers, and urban green spaces as every other resident. Mobility and transportation, addresses well-maintained lighted streets, roadways, signage, and other mechanisms to assure pedestrians and vehicle safety and opportunity for walking and biking as every other resident. Economic development, addresses ensure all residents have public economic development investments as residents of every other parts of the city. Housing standards, every resident is as entitled to the protection provided by city enforcement of housing codes as every other resident. Workforce protection. Every person who is employed within the city is as entitled to protection against injury, discrimination, and wage theft as every other employee. Neighborhood amenities. Residents of every neighborhood are as entitled to amenities provided by the city such as cultural presentations or library services as residents of every other neighborhood. Nothing in this section is intended to not or, or not shall be construed as to create binding funding obligations for the city or cause actions against the city. Next slide, please. Next slide. Equity assessment. So these are just some examples of where we will be having, we're recommending that an equity assessment is taking place whenever there's um, new budgeting. Um, and these are the factors I'm going to explain and presenting at a public hearing. So this is the, sli the last um, slide. So um, an equity assessment shall be conducted for the annual operating and capital budgets as contained in the recommendation 
recommended budget budgets generated by the city manager as fiscal year and for major policies and programs to decide upon by the city council. Assessments shall include the following elements. Disproportionate impact. Does the proport disproportionate impact? Does the proposed change have any disproportionate impact on racial or ethnic minorities or people of low income or other groups categorized as having categorized as having experienced discrimination? Representation. Does a proposed change increase or decrease the level of representation of racial or ethnic minorities and or people of lower income or other groups that have experienced discrimination in city decision making? Accountability. Does a proposed change create or increase the extent to which city officials and staff are accountable to racial or ethnic minorities and or low income people or other groups that have experienced discrimination? Access. Does the proposed change increase or decrease the access of ethnic or racial minorities at low income people or other groups um, who have experienced discrimination? Fair share. Does the proposed change increase or decrease the extent to which ethnic or racial minorities or low income people um, have experienced fair share of city services or benefits? Safety and security. Does the proposed change increase or decrease the safety and security of ethnic and racial minorities and or low income people and other, um, and, or other groups who have experienced uh, discrimination? Meet needs. Does the proposed change increase or decrease the ability of the city to meet, increase significant, to meet significant needs of ethnic or racial minorities and or low income people or other groups that have experienced discrimination. As, as you can see, this, um, this recommendation of additions to the city charter, which would be in, contained within Article 6, um, are really intended to, to bring equity and equality to our city. And, you know, some people may believe that um, we haven't had a problem in this area in our city. Um, and we don't talk about this much here, but in, in fact, it is. And you may, you know, I've lived here since 71, and some of you have lived longer or less, but you may observe some of what we're talking about here in our city, in our very city. And we're intending that with this recommendation, we will address those disparities and make our community safe for everyone. So with that, um, the yeah, next thank you, slide Richard, is, and let's um, move yes. us to your second proposal. Yes, I, I was going to say. Yeah, can we move get the slides up for the second proposal? And it'll be briefer. Uh, Lawrence, can you put up the second proposal, please? So the Ye yes, and this is the um, this is the uh, uh, equity and budgeting presentation. Yes. Got yes, it. Thank you. Okay, so the second proposal that I'm, I'm going to present is um, actually um, takes the proposal you just heard, the, this recommendation, the first recommendation, and actually puts it into some language into the city charter. And, um, you know, again, you know, we can start off with the conditions of our city. And um, um, if, you, if you would like, um, Lawrence, please go to, let me see, like slide four. Okay, so the city charter does not prevent inequities by ensuring equality for all in its residents. The goal of, of this recommendation that, I was, that I'm going to provide is to create equity and inclusion in city budgeting and programs. And as I said, the recommendation that you heard previously is citywide and um, a very broad, broad recommendation. This takes it down to one specific area, which is city budgeting and programs. Next slide. Next slide, please. So the change will be in, in, um, in um, three existing city articles. Article four, which is about the mayor's responsibility, the, I'm sorry, article four, which is the council responsibility, article five, the mayor responsibility, and article seven, the city responsibility, the city manager. 
So um, they do not at this time address equity, these particular articles. And so therefore we are making the following changes. I mean, the following recommendations as changes. Next slide, please. So this is for the city council article four and the department heads policy objectives consent to hire is, is the topic. So the citizen shall adopt a written statement of policy for each city department, which is under the administration of the city manager and the policy statement shall set forth the broad goals, objectives, and aspirations to, the accomplished, to be accomplished by that department. The recommended addition is the statement of policy shall adhere and follow specific criteria as set forth in Article 6, which is the one we just covered, statement of values. Next slide, please. So Article 5 is is has to do with the mayor's responsibility the mayor the mayor's powers and duties the mayor shall have the following duties if the mayor recommends any increases in the city budget the mayor shall recommend shall recommend the method of financing such expenditures and it's recommended to add and ensure these recommendations adhere to article 6 equity assessment so we would do the we would do the equity assessment on those increases in a budget for a particular area. And and the the article currently states if the mayor proposed the curtailment of any services, the mayor shall provide specific recommendations and the reasons for the proposal. And here we recommend adding. If the mayor, upon receiving an equity assessment, as set forth in Article 6, equity assessment, which results in portions of the budget do not adhere to the equity requirements in Article 6, the mayor shall recommend remedial action. Next slide, please. Okay. Article 7, this is the city manager's responsibility. So the city manager's powers and duties, one of them is E, the city manager shall prepare and submit the annual budget to the city council in accordance with provision section 1204. The recommended addition is each section of the budget will be evaluated according with, will be evaluated in accordance with article six, equity assessment and adjusted to adhere with Article 6 equity standards. Next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry, not yet. The, the city manager still submit a complete report on the finances and administrative, administrative activities of the city as of the end of the preceding fiscal year. And we recommend the annual report will adhere in detail the equity requirements in Article, Article 6. Next slide. Who benefits? Who is burdened? All San Jose will benefit. Living in a city that respects and treats all of its residents equitably creates a safer and more prosperous community. This helps business and creates more opportunities for those in need. The consequences may be that those who have received unfair advantages may need to receive less services. Next slide. That's the last slide. Okay, that's the last slide. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, so um, just in summary, um, I know this language might be might be complicated if you've you know reading it for the first time, and, and it's also taken out of the context because you're not looking at the whole city charter. But the intent is that throughout our our city government, we want to make sure that there is equity and equality, because we want our whole city to have the advantages and the benefits that the city can provide. And one thing that I did not show is that in, in slides that I skipped over, these, these areas that, that we're talking about here um, will provide better access to the communities that have the greatest need, where these services, the city services of parks, libraries, all of these things, 
really represent better health, better well-being, better quality of life for individuals with the greatest needs. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Fuentes. And let's go to the public. And if, again, if you'd like to come on on either or both, let us know. Uh, City Clerk can call the first speaker. Paul Soto. Uh, thank you, uh, Senora Fuentes, for that uh, presentation. This is, this is a writing from a uh, campesino for nearly all people from California, for, for nearly all people, there is a thing that is more important than money. It is a thing called dignity or self-respect or honor. It shows itself in many ways. Sometimes it is shown by the man who will fight when he is insulted. We who are the farm workers who have been insulted, we have seen ourselves treated like cattle. We have seen how they have taken the work of our hands and our bodies and made themselves rich while we were left empty hands between earth and sky. We have seen our children treated as inferiors in the schools. We have seen the face of the cop, our inequality before the law. We have known what it is like to be less than disrespected, to be unwanted, to live in a world which did not belong to us. Our color, our language, our job have kept us apart. And the people who are profiting from our separateness are determined to keep it that way. It is a fact that the San Francisco Growers Association keeps an office full time writing propaganda about how farm workers are all winos, bums, and incompetents. There is money in the advancement of these lies. We who are picking the grapes and the peaches and the tomatoes, which are the lifeblood of California, are soon going to share in the richness we have made. The little fights against the little grower and the contractor that you read about today, they are only the beginning. The dignity of the farm worker shows itself in many ways. This year and the years to come, it will be shown by the man who will fight when he is insulted. And this right here is an insult. This city should be embarrassed considering that it maintained and profited from these types of conditions that all spawn from redlining. This document is trying to atone for that, but yet it does not have, it doesn't even have the shame to admit culpability and profit. People built reputations, people built mansions on it. Tessa Woodmancy. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Tessa Woodmancy. Thank you. Thank you, Paul Soto. Um, thank you, Maria Fuentes. I, I just wanted to mention that Maria is a master's in social worker from the Santa Clara County Mental Health Board and dealing with adults. And just really appreciate the, you know, this, um, this commission that we've created to really work on the issues that are really facing our community. And that equity issue really rang true to me as I have dealt as a, a mother, a stay-at-home mother who has raised her two children and lived in the low income areas because we only had that one income, my husband's income. And I made those choices for values to, because I valued the, my staying home to take care of my children full time. And, and yet what had happened is like Paul Soto said, I lived near, near the horseshoe in West, uh, in, in uh, North Willow Glen, where the railroads were put, where the highways were put, where the diesel was put. And then when we bought a house, the only house we could afford was on Stockton Avenue, so because, but it's right by the rail and the diesel and the bus diesel, the bus depot, the diesel bus depot. And so, yes, it has affected my health. I, I have multiple sclerosis and I have seen my, my neighbors um, die of, of, of all the pollution in my neighborhood. And I just met another neighbor who just had cancer. She's a beautiful neighbor who's lived here on Sheely and she's had to go through cancer. And, you know, and, we've, and she was the one neighbor who was fighting the air pollution. And so when Maria says in our equity, you know, that is the thing. And I've been fighting it since I got here. The attack we had from Rural Coach Tours, the bus depot, as we try to deal with their diesel, idling of their diesel buses. And then our city, the real tragedy, our city had no noise ordinance, no pollution ordinances to control it. And these are the inequities that came in my neighborhood because I was living, I call it, on the thorn side of the Rose Garden. And so we need to really deal with the inequity, our pollution, our noise controls. And these are issues. All in user two. Yeah, uh, the one area I think the city has equity in is the way we are treated by the city and the police department. We're all treated like crap. 
And a lot of these people, Colin, they talk about white people, how we somehow get something extra. We don't. We get dumped on like everybody else does. And when we complain, which the word white, let's go back to what Paul Soto said. I'm not white. I'm a European. Okay. So any of you want to change some language, instead of saying white, why don't you put in European people? Okay. That's equity right there if you would. But I, I'm not a color and I don't speak a language called white. And quite frankly, I'm one of the original Latinos because I'm Italian with a lot of vowels in my name. I want you guys to know when there's an Irish policeman and you're an Italian, you're in trouble. Okay. And, and you know, it, it does. They, hey, they see a lot of vowels. They get nervous, those guys. They can't help it. They're good people, some of them. Some of them. Some of them. Believe me, I'm not pro-police. If you listen to me long enough, you'll start defending them the way, the way I talk, the things I have to say about them. But if you want, the, the, the equity is how they treat people. And they treat people with smugness, snootiness, snootiness, condescending attitudes. They don't even have to start uh, shouting out racial epithets to you. It's just their attitude and how they look at their watch while they're uh, writing you a citation or they come to your house and tell you that you've been victimized, there's nothing that they're going to be able to do about it. That's the equity, right? Is their do nothingness, their, their, their lack of character, their irresponsive. I'll tell you what they have equity in down the city hall is they're all equitable. Sandra Asher. Hi, thank you. Um, I wanted to say that I appreciate the equity proposals. Um, both of them I'd like to speak to. Um, I appreciate you putting that forward and wanting to make those changes for our city. I would ask that you look to specifically call out the disability community um, in your proposal uh, instead of being lumped under other groups uh, because the disability community often is overlooked and especially in the city of San Jose and in our government, we've asked for an ADA coordinator and other equity issues and routinely um, are ignored. So I would uh, request that you specifically call us out. And in terms of looking at the equity budget, always looking at ableism and looking at ensuring our disabled residents are fully included. Thank you. Victor Sin. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Victor Sin. I'm from San Jose and the Santa Clara Valley chapter of the ACLU of Northern California. I will comment on both recommendations. We support draft recommendation five to amend the city charter by adding an equity statement of values, by describing equity standards and calling out various aspects, and by specifying an equity assessment. Consistent with this support, we welcome draft recommendation nine to explicitly bring the issue of equity to the council, the mayor, and the city manager. Thank you. Carmen B. Hi, I'm Carmen Bremer, and I'm a voter in District 8. I'm also a member of the Black Leadership Kitchen Cabinet and the Real Coalition. I'm going to speak on racial equity. And what I want to share is COVID-19 has forced those who want to deny racial inequities exist in San Jose to really face the truth. Pandemic data clearly shows that our underserved and underrepresented communities of color have been and continue to be disproportionately impacted by policies and programs that do not benefit, benefit us. One fact I'd like to share is that we experience the highest numbers of infection cases and deaths. So I encourage the commission to support the proposal for the city of San Jose to be guided by a racial and social equity framework and principles, and that the city must address its legacy of historic racial inequities and be accountable to change those in decision-making processes on policies, budgets, and programs. Thank you. Back to the chair. Thank you. Thank you, members of the public. Um, let's go to our next two items. Um, the first one is department audits. Uh, which Commissioner Zhao will present, and then followed by amendment to the San Jose Charter to address the climate change impacts through the establishment of a Climate Crisis Action Commission uh, in the City Charter. And that'll be Commissioner Segal. 
And so let's start with um, Commissioner Zhao talking about Department of Audits. Department Audits, I'm sorry. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Hello? we can. Yes, and we can see the uh, your slides as well. Okay. Um, so this recommendation is uh, about uh, the city auditing. It's submitted by our entire um, commission. That's uh, including Commissioner Calendar, Commissioner Segal, Commissioner Segura, Commissioner Amador. Um, the problem that we discovered is that our city auditing function um, are solely determined by the city council. And the second, it's lack of a department-wide auditing function. This recommendation is to remove political pressure from decision-making process and to bring greater financial accountability for our city. The city charter uh, section 805 uh, gives the power and the duty of the city's auditor's office. The charter grants the access to the city auditor's office and authority to examine all the records of the city department's office and agency. The performance auditing function is the essential element to hold the city operation and services accountable, efficiency, and effectiveness. Um, the, current the current auditing process is that the auditor's office will prepare a auditing annual auditing work plan um, using a risk matrix methodology. Um, every year they submitted this work plan to the rules committee. The rules committee would then um, makes the determination of the annual auditing tasks. They may um, completely accept the city auditor's recommendation, or they may choose to uh, partially exact or completely ignore the recommendation. Therefore, um, the current auditing uh, process could potentially cause some department um, or some area of the department constantly being left out and never gets audited for decades. Additionally, the auditor's office have been mainly focused on a specific area of the city department and do a in-depth auditing. A smaller scale auditing is certainly very important. However, the department-wide performance auditing is critical and essential to track the key performance goals of the city services and currently the department-wide performance auditing were barely conducted. The missing of such function on a regular basis could cause misuse of city resources, lack of accountability, and even corruption. A larger scale department auditing are necessary to ensure our taxpayers' resources are being spent on a physical responsible manner to ensure the highest quality of service to our community. So how has this problem possibly benefit uh, or burden our people? The increased accountability of all city services benefits every Sanzi resident by ensuring physical responsibility and maximum quality of service especially for underserved communities who rely heavily on city services, resources, and supports. Um, the change that we're proposing is to add um, to the city charter a section 805.3. A department-wide performance audit must be conducted to all city departments to assess key performance against its mission goals and objectives in order to ensure accountability and physical responsibility. The constituent facing departments should get a department-wide performance audit at least every six years, while the remaining departments 
should get a department-wide performance audit at least every 12 years. The audit reports should be presented at public meetings with trackable correction items and follow-ups. Is this change visible? Yes, we think this change is very feasible and necessary to ensure the increased accountability. San Jose has an audit function already in place. This simply adds a larger scope to the current audit process to ensure a higher quality of oversight and accountability for taxpayers. This may require to increase the budget and capacity of the auditor's office. Who oh, might benefit? Every of us will benefit from this change by providing an increased level of accountability and oversight for communities. This will make sure that no part of any city department goes unaudited for more than a 12 year period. It helps detect fraud, embezzlement, and other crimes, as well, as well as it identifies potential ways to decrease spending and increase efficiency. This improves financial accountability in the city of San Jose. The workload and budget for the auditor's office are likely to increase. What are the arguments? The arguments could be that the scope of the department-wide audit is too large. However, um, without doing it, it might cost us more. And also, um, according to the auditor's uh, office, uh, every dollar that we spend on the office budget, it, it will generate uh, $2 in cost saving uh, revenue increase. Uh, must this be a charter revision? Yes, we think so, because it would ensure this is an unbiased approach that will not be influenced by our elected officials or impacted department staffs. Uh, this has to be a charter revision. This uh, concludes my presentation. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Zhao. And now Commissioner uh, Siegel. Sorry, lost my place. Commissioner Siegel. Thank you. I am wondering if you can see my screen. Not yet. No? Not yet. Nope. Uh, I'm sharing it. I'm sharing. Hmm. Oh, okay. Uh, can you yes, see? Yes, now we can. Yes, now we can. Thank you. So, um, we are proposing a Climate Action Commission. It used to be called Climate Crisis Action Commission, but one of the commissioners wanted this. So we, we changed, not on our subcommittee, when we got feedback on Monday, from the other commissioners, somebody wanted this name change and we were doing that. Um, so it's called a Climate Action Commission. What is the problem? The problem is uh, the climate change impacts, right? The climate change proposes immediate and long-term threats to the city's economy, public health, sustainability, security and quality of life, especially those of, um, who are low income and with the least amount of resources. So why a Climate Action Commission? Uh, climate change is going to amplify the already existing divide between those who have resources and those who do not. And um, this comes from, it's a quote by Elliot Levine. Um, if you look at San Jose, um, 88,152 people in San Jose live in poverty. That's approximately 8.7% of the population. That comes from US Census data of 2019. Um, and an astounding 47% of Bay Area's households do, um, do have uh, air conditioning. That means that 53% do not. That's a lot of households that do not have air conditioning. And again, that's the US Census Bureau in 2019. Um, you know, we have over 7 million people in the Bay Area, but this is counting households because, you know, multiple people live in houses. So that's a lot of folks that don't have air conditioning in, um, and we are approaching extreme heat events 
like Canada has seen, like the Pacific Northwest has seen, uh, where thousands of people can die in the span of a week um, and have simply because they were not able to get cool enough and the temperatures were above 120, 122, 125. Um, not everyone can handle that kind of heat. So 23 trillion reduced annual global economic output worldwide as a result of climate change. This is um, coming from a Swiss Institute report from 2021. How has this impacted San Jose? So we're talking worldwide, right? So um, on a worldwide right now, we have um, in Glasgow, it is day seven of the UN Climate Summit and Greta Thunberg is there right now. And um, she is leading 20, a, a climate, um, uh, climate action group there of 26,000 people who are protesting the um, UN Summit in Glasgow. They have an iceberg and that iceberg is basically saying, hey, it's melting right in front of you. So they actually somehow dragged a piece of a real iceberg and stuck it right in front of, um, of the UN and the, the commission there. And it's melting, like day by day it's melting. And, and that is how fast this is going, folks. It's going this fast. How has it impacted San Jose? I mean, remember this, right? Cruise battle, um, the creek bed fire right here in San Jose. And then we can just look at what's happened to us. Three years later, Coyote Creek flood victims still fighting for justice. Um, heat wave breaks, bakes the Bay Area as triple digit temperatures spread and second flex alert are called. The Bay Area's neighborhoods are hit hardest by heat. Oh, and which neighborhoods are those? The poorest neighborhoods are far hotter than rich ones. And here's an article about that that came out in the Mercury News on July 19th, um, 2021. And of course, who can forget? None of us, none, we are all traumatized by that August um, 2020 thunderstorm that we all heard <laughs> starting, you know, in the dark, we all heard it, we all kind of woke up to it. The lightning strikes sparked wildfire and we were just in a ring of fire. And here's that ring of fire. Acres burned 396, 624 acres in the SCU Lightning Complex fire. Stanislaus, Santa Clara, Alameda, Contra Costa, San Joaquin counties. It's a lot of counties to burn up. And of course, right here in Santa Cruz, right our neighbor south, our Southern County, the CZU Lightning Complex, 222 structures destroyed. Um, it's, it's incredible. So what change are we proposing? We're proposing the city create a commission. There's already a ton of boards and commissions. We're just asking for this one, one to be created, specifically looking at climate change. And the people that we want on it are residents, people who actually live here. Um, we don't want people who work for the city to be on this uh, climate commission because then you have an echo chamber, right? You've got people who already work for the city repeating their policy recommendations to the city council through their employment and then also on this board. That's not gonna help. We want, an in, we want citizens, residents, residents of San Jose to actually have a path to in an organized manner make yearly or more often than yearly, at a minimum yearly recommendations to city council about what what we can do on a local level to mitigate climate change. Okay, so this is this is what this commission would do. It would uh, study, create, and recommend policy and programs that help address and mitigate the impacts of climate change. Um, climate Action Commission membership. You know, we took your input, so this is different from Monday because people had a lot of input and we, we took that input. So it would be 10 district representatives and one citywide. So the mayor would get to pick one. Each city council person would get to pick one. Two individuals um, representing the interests of the Mawakme Ohlone tribes and three experts who are scientists, just three volunteer scientists in the field. And, and you know, we made this purposefully broad so, so that, you know, ecologists, biologists, 
um, food systems folks, recycling folks, and of course, just climate experts. There are legitimate people, scientists that only study climate change. And we had one of those folks speak to us from Stanford. So we're, we're leaving that broad, but we do want three scientists there to sort of inform the rest of the committee. Um, two artists, this is a new thing. We And why two artists? All right, well, let me tell you, if you watched our presentation on Monday, you will note that this PowerPoint wasn't there. It was just me reading the typing that we had typed up on a piece of paper. It really took an artist to be able to communicate what we're trying to say in, um, in a way that the public could understand it much more easily. And when you look at um, what artists can do and how they think, it really is different than how scientists perhaps look and think because artists are interpreters. They create art out of their lived experiences and they have the unique ability to connect ideas to policies in a visual um, or linguistical multimedia relatable way. And so, you know, just having this PowerPoint versus not is an example of that. And so we're leaving that also broad to include, you know, graphic artists, visual artists, web design folks, anybody who can take the idea based in science and be able to translate that to folks that live in the city so that if you do come up with a great idea or if we want to support a particular Climate Smart San Jose program, which their, their, um, their public facing programs are really not well um, supported by the community, if we want to help support them or help support any ideas we come up with, it's really the artists that I think that are going to make that connection. So we have two seats filled with artists, two by youth representatives. Why the youth? Because they're inheriting the climate disaster that we're leaving them. So they should have a voice in potential mitigations. Um, and then one attorney at law, because you know scientists, artists, and the youth may have lots of ideas, and it would be really nice for an attorney to somehow be able to collect them in a way that they can pass all of that to the city council in an organized manner. And so we just think that would be beneficial if there were an attorney on this commission. Um, and so what would it do? It would study climate change. It would foster resident engagement, hold public hearings and study sessions to collaborate with the community, work with the city staff in partnership um, to ensure feasibility of any programs and make recommendations to city council. Um, and so the topics so far could be habitat management, tree canopy, education, rehabilitation, um, lots and lots of topics. Is it proposed uh, feasible? Of course, the city of San Jose currently supports 29 plus boards and commissions that all have various powers and duties to study, create and recommend policy and programs to council. And this, this CAC would follow a similar form and structure to that. Why must we act now to protect all people of San Jose to protect our economy and the quality of life and to protect mm -hmm. future generations um, and these are all the people that presented um, to either our subcommittee or to the commission as a whole. When we put up their names, we're not saying that they have a position for or against this proposal. It's just simply that these folks all came and spoke to us, right? So these are all the folks that came and spoke to us. We got a lot of subject matter experts, lots and lots and lots. Um, and this is your opportunity. So on the 15th, November 15th, this commission is gonna be discussing and doing provisional voting on, on all of these recommendations you heard and on the 18th, it's final votes. And on December 14th, your city council will hear and discuss all of these recommendations. So that's the opportunity for further input that you have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Segal. Now let's go to the public. Uh, first speaker, please. So would Mancy? All right. We got. Thank you, Tessa Woodman. C. Um, basically, the issues of our charter review for the climate crisis is very critical, and that we cannot base it on the political arena because the political arena is 
is is bound fascistically bound with corporations and business as usual so we need the chart it needed to be in the charter so it cannot be at the whims of the political uh, arena and it needs to be more than what is being proposed what was being proposed is a is in a abridged version of what the science is really saying that we need my husband as a um as a climate and biological scientist biologist has worked on the document and the document, as I, I, I sent to you today, really had three legs. And the first leg was data collection. That's very critical, that we need to see at a granular level what the city is doing. And that's what was proposed. The, the, the commission took the third leg, which was creating what my husband referred to as a climate crisis um, commission. He called it C3. And I think the word crisis needs to be in it because that's the truth. And we need the, the other leg, which is data collection. And that that data about our fossil fuel use needs to be collected from all departments on a granular level so to really see into these this issue of our fossil fuel use and what mitigations are going to be required by that they can propose, as well as to share that with the public. And like I've been saying, in Times Square, New York City, where I'm from, there is a big sign, a digital sign, the only digital sign I would allow in our city to show us going to zero. That's what we need to all see because that is our survival. And the one in, in Times Square is saying that we have eight years to do that. It's a countdown for the eight years. And the other leg that my husband was, was suggesting was building resilient communities. And we must put that in. And all the members of the commission need to accept the science that we need to go. Call in user two. You guys, people talking about this uh, climate summit in Glasgow, all those ruling elites, including Greta Thornburg, whatever her name is, showing up on private jets, five-star hotels. Our our president, let's go, Brandon. He's got uh, how many uh, SUVs in his in his with his entourage of people? Was it 60 SUV? I forget how many cars he's got there to drive around in with uh, fossil fuels. Right. These are the people who are going to lead you into uh, some sort of environmental controls. I don't think so. They're just going to tax you and fine you and keep you down while they live in a lap of luxury. And then we've got the San Jose City Council that constantly budgets money for all these free backpacks for the kids every single year. All these plastic backpacks and free, di free disposable diapers and disposable wipes, which end up in the landfill. These are going to be the people who are going to be controlling the uh, environment in this city. I don't think so. You got a fire department that can't put out a fire where the fires burn for hours before they even decide to show up, whether they're in the foothills or even an actual building structure, which pollutes the environment. You got all these police on motorcycles zooming around, giving you citations. That's not very environmental. We can just go down the list. How about all those plastic, uh, things that they put downtown on the, where the bike lanes are. I call them, I call them Sam's rubber baby uh, bumpers. You know, they're all made out of plastic. It's an eyesore. And imagine all the polymers that were used to pollute the earth to make those stupid things for those stupid bike lanes, which, by the way, all this road diet and everything else, it's, it's, it's going to create a lot of contamination. There's going to be more traffic, and there's going to all, all the road supply. Dave W.? Hi. Yes. Um, we always hear a lot about climate change. I think one thing that everybody needs to realize, uh, guess what? The climate on the earth has always been in a state of change. It has never been constant. And I think one of the things that people are unaware of, but this is an article that appeared in the Mercury News, I don't remember when, several years ago, but they talked about the 200-year drought. Yes, that was 200 years. Um, and that occurred uh, around uh, 1850 uh, to uh, 1050. Um, and that was uh, something that California is nowhere prepared for now. We came and handle a, a drought for just a, a couple of years because we shuffle all the water out to the ocean. Now that's Gavin Newsom's decision. That's not a San Jose decision. But one thing I like to point out, uh, when we talk about climate change, there's always this discussion about green energy. And green energy means wind and solar. That is completely unrealistic. If you really want a realistic 
reduction of uh, carbon emi uh, emissions, and by the way, zero emissions is an unrealistic goal. That's um, uh, totally ridiculous, but I can understand uh, reducing carbon emissions by a good amount, but we need the cooperation from the rest of the world. But anyway, back to my point. Reliable energy is always necessary for a successful economy. Can you do it with uh, minimal carbon emissions? Yes, you can, but it's with nuclear and hydro uh, power, not solar and not wind. The wind kills um, endangered species birds as well as other birds. Don't hear that from the environmentalists for whatever reason, I don't understand. And uh, solar farms take up huge areas. Nuclear and hydropower is what we need to concentrate on. Thank you. Back to the chair. Thank you. Our ninth proposal today uh, is Article 21, the promotion of home ownership opportunities for low-income residents of San Jose. And that's going to be Commissioner Fuentes, followed by the Community uh, to Purchase Act, or uh, COPA, which is going to be Commissioner Amador. Commissioner Fuentes. Thank you. And uh, thank you, Lawrence. Okay, so um, it's actually Article 22. I mean, I'm sorry, Article 20. And it's the promotion of home ownership opportunities for low income residents of San Jose. So, you know, we have, um, we have um, heard a number of proposals today, recommendations and um, um, This one is is touching on home ownership. Um, as we know, we have a serious problem in our city regarding housing. So this is what this one is about. Um, next slide. Next slide. San Jose housing crisis. Within Santa Clara County, San Jose is the largest and fastest growing housing center. Yet low income residents do not find homes for purchase affordable on their otherwise adequate income. Many individuals and families must live in crowded shared homes and apartments. And I believe we're all very aware of this issue. Next slide. There was a study done by the Silicon uh, in for 2021, the Silicon Valley poll. And it was issued by Joan, Joan Ventures Silicon Valley. And these are just a, some of their findings. 56% of the respondents likely to leave region in the next few years. Cost of living and housing costs are the top reasons. 76% identify the cost of housing, the most serious problem in the Bay Area. And I think we all, all are very aware of this, this problem. And now we want to find solutions. Next slide. Next slide, please. Slow here. Oh, okay. Proposed propose change to the city charter. The city charter does not serve its residents with the greatest needs for housing. Therefore, Article 20, the promotion of home ownership opportunities for low income residents of San Jose is proposed. And I want to mention that there is an Article 19, which we're not talking about today, but that article also addresses housing in our city. Next slide. So I'm going to go over the actual um, um, article 20 that's recommended. The first is the findings and the purpose. The people of San Jose find it must establish new policies to support the purchase of affordable housing by low income San Jose residents while not impacting existing policies or resources that are available to support affordable rental housing for its residents. And again, this is gonna be a whole new article that we're being proposed here. Next slide. Therefore, Article 20, the promotion of home ownership opportunities for low income residents of San Jose has the goal to meet this need, which is vital to the long-term stability of San Jose as home to its residents. And this point about the stability of San Jose is key. And I am certain that probably everyone on this, on this, in this hearing tonight, today 
realizes that we have lost people who have left the area, family, friends, co-workers, just because they can't afford to to sustain the life here, you know, with the high cost of rent and housing. Next slide. So these are the definitions of the terms in Article 20. Low income residents, that's defined by 60% of the average monthly income or some other widely acceptable measure in the future. Affordable housing. Somebody should pay no more than 30% of their income for a mortgage. Purchase, house for purchase includes detached homes, condominiums, townhouses, duplexes, etc. Next slide. Okay, so this, this is going to go into the city policy. The following policy is intended to directly assist San Jose residents who otherwise would not be able to purchase a home in San Jose because their salary will not qualify them to purchase available homes for sale. This policy shall not impact already existing or future land that provides rental housing. Next slide. So the policy has six major points. Comprehensive study, well, you can see, you can read them. They're, they're right here on the screen. And so there's six six um, areas and so i'm just going to go right into the first one which is comprehensive study at least every other year the mayor and city council shall conduct a comprehensive study which identifies opportunities that will assist san jose residents purchase a home it could be legislation that's come about you know uh, contributions from from uh, the pub the private sector or even philanthropy next slide Upon identifying opportunities per the study, the mayor and city council will delegate the responsibility to pursue, promote, and participate in opportunities for home purchase for its residents, starting with low income residents. So the, the city of San Jose is already involved in many areas in terms of housing, but this one in particular in Article 20 has to do with the purchase of homes for low income residents. Next slide. On a regular basis, the city of San Jose shall identify land not currently sown for housing, which is highly suitable to convert to land to be used for affordable housing for purchase. And this section shall not apply to the land covered by Article 19. Next slide. The city of San Jose negotiates new business development community benefit programs you know when there's going to be like for instance google is is the one that's 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 the huge the biggest um to assist okay as the city of san jose negotiates new business developments community benefit programs to assist low-income residents as defined by the city housing department to achieve to achieve home ownership shall be included in those community benefit programs with new business developments coming to our city. Next slide, please. As a city of, okay, so an additional policies and programs to promote home ownership by low income residents, which are, which are, which are subsidy incentive and educationally based, including those that are voluntary rather than reg regulatory based shall be explored. Next slide. This slide is is critical to to this um, to this um, recommendation, um, and so we're here. We're talking about um, looking at an equity analysis um, shall be incorporated into everything that's done with this, and we look at structural equity, procedural equity, distributional equity, and transgenerational equity. And clearly, there's a lot of areas that we would need to look at with respect to equity and housing. Next slide. So in essence, those are the that's the, the essence of the policies in Article 20. Next slide. Who benefits the direct benefits of this proposal are low income residents defined in Article 20 as 60% of the 
AMI, or some other widely acceptable measures in the future. And there's no burden on the city of San Jose with this charter recommendation. And I want to add that, you know, the beneficiary of anything like this, anything having to do with housing, um, is the entire city because it brings stability to our community. It stabilizes the workforce. It stabilizes people in school. Everything is, is um, improved for our city if we address housing issues. Uh, next slide. And must this be a charter revision? Yes, the housing crisis in San Jose includes burdens faced by low-income working residents who most likely would never be able to buy a home in their city. This reality appears to be cemented into the local economy, which is extremely, extremely um, damaging to our city. So Article 20 contains proactive, results-oriented support toward the possibility of home ownership for these residents with the city of San Jose leadership to implement if Article 20 is approved by the voters of San Jose. And I want to add that um, this particular um, proposal uh, recommendation, um, we had um, great support and assistance from Bob Brownstein and the two other commissioners that are involved are um, Commissioner Amador and Commissioner Sao. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Fuentes. Commissioner uh, Amador. Great, thank you. And I will be presenting today the memo to City Council, um, and this will be a policy recommendation. Um, it will not be a charter amendment, but rather a policy recommendation on the Community Purchase Act, uh, known as COPA. Um, and this memo seeks to improve and improve seeks to promote and improve accountability, representation, and inclusion under a racial equity lens within the housing department and anti-displacement efforts at the city of San Jose by promoting and supporting the Community to Purchase Act, COPA, that promotes the prevention of tenant displacement and the creation and preservation of community-owned affordable housing to build a more just and equitable city. Preservation strategies are needed in order to prevent further displacement, segregation, and negative quality of life and generational poverty. Preservation strategies often struggle, sorry, often struggle for funding sources and commitment from cities, which ultimately imp impact Black, Indigenous people, and people of color and low-income families. Preservation strategies are necessary to address long-term affordability and to complement our housing production goals and not net loss ratios. Preservation strategies are key to ensure BIPOC families do not experience homelessness in a cycle of institutional violence. Protecting tenants' rights, producing affordable housing and investments should be seen as a long-term priority as part of our mission to cement our city's commitment to ending displacement and materializing housing as a human right sorry, materializing housing as a human right. Um, again, this was uh, something asked from council as well when we talk about inclusion, uh, diversity and representation and accountability. Um, this also aligns with the city of San Jose newly created Office of Racial Equity and advancing systems to change through a citywide racial equity framework that will examine and improve San Jose's internal policies and programs and practices to eradicate any structural and or institutional racism in the city of San Jose. In addition, the SCOPA memo aligns with the overall San Jose anti-displacement goals and strategies set Four, for community input, housing department directions, city council board approval. The 10 recommendations in this multi-year strategy are designed to complement each other and are listed below. The recommendations are prioritized by timing from near term to medium term. Um, and that is supporting equitable COVID-19 recovery and impact mitigation measure for renters and homeowners, establish a neighborhood tenant preference for affordable housing, explore a community opportunity pur purchase program ordinance or COPA, increase equitable representation of historically underrepresented communities on city commissions, create a role for local government and state tenants protections, increase housing quality and prevention code enforcement related to displacement, create a preservation report policy, develop uh, YIGBI land use, uh, and that is yes in God's backyard, um, optimize urban village for affordable housing development and anti-displacement and establish new source of funding for affordable housing and anti-displacement. Um, and you can check that out more at the, um, the, uh, the website in San Jose, your government department office, a strategy, citywide anti-displacement strategy. 
This memo also aligns with their commission agreements that we value diversity um, that we put forward at the beginning. We believe that bringing it together a broad range of ideas, experiences, and background will result in the best outcomes for San Jose to keep an open mind and seek to learn from others. And this, we can no longer wait, nor be scared of co-ops or community land trusts because we have seen these policies make changes through the country in cities like San Francisco and Washington, D.C. Co-ops uh, and community ownership models have been discussed by city councils as well as address, uh, address the impact of displacements. We are seeing how is this a problem and a possible benefit? We are seeing neighborhoods rapidly changing before our eyes over the last few years with increase in home sales and evictions of dozens of families. Many of our neighbors have been displaced. We are seeing the destabilization of our once culturally rich communities, cultures, and heritage erased from spaces and our local family-owned businesses close. Several documents provide data to the urgent need to create prevention measures to, to staff displacement and its impact on communities of color. And again, according to a staff memorandum, I quote a 2016 report from Urban Habits found a significant regional out migration of Black and Latinx households to outlining areas of the Bay Area or to neighborhood countries like San Joaquin and Stainless. Um, further, a 2018 study from the California Housing Partnership and Urban Displacement Projects found that rising housing costs have led to large increase in Black and Latinx households living in high poverty and segregated areas. Between 2000 and 2015, the study found that found a 15% increase in the number of Black households and a 100% increase in the number of Latinx households living in segregated and high poverty neighborhoods in the Bay Area. Quote, furthermore, locally in San Jose, according to the UPD research, um, 18 to uh, research 18, 43% of all census tracts in the San Jose are either at risk of or experiencing ongoing displacement. While all city council districts are experiencing some level of displacement, council district three and five have the highest numbers of census tracts with either ongoing displacement or being at risk of displacement. Latinx households are overrepresented in this areas. In San Jose, 47% of all Latinx households and 45% of all black households live in areas categorized as experiencing ongoing displacement or at risk of displacement. ASCOPA attempts to address historical and current discrimination based on home ownership and opportunities to build wealth. The same memo highlights the racial impacts of home ownership. And I quote, in San Jose, Black households have a home ownership rate of 33%. The home ownership rate for Latinx is 41%. In comparison to white households, um, the, hi the highest home ownership rate in the city is 66%. Furthermore, COPA attempts to address the racial impact of the 2018 foreclosure on BIPOC communities. From 2007 to 2008, East San Jose was named ground zero of the foreclosure crisis and nationwide Black and Latinx communities were 2 to 2.5 times more likely to experience foreclosure than their white peers. Wealth building is connected to asset ownership and BIPOC communities and value of assets own and also impact by racism. Housing displacement greatly impacts Black and Latinx residents as it relates to affordability, home stability, and overcrowded homes, as well as which greatly impact families during the COVID pandemic and cause health harms. Unemployment and other economic barriers tied to housing leads to overrepresentation of Black and Latinx families in the homeless count. Displacement is happening now, and it's been happening. The need to continue supporting and establishing Establishing a neighborhood tenant community owned housing needs to be prioritized as long term solutions. Uh, what changes are we proposing? So, no, we're not proposing any changes to the charter, but rather support policies that will prioritize establishing and continuing to support community opportunity to purchase program or COPA and in creating new sources of funding for affordable housing community ownership models in anti displacement and the continuation of tenant protection. Uh, following the examples of San Francisco and Washington, D.C., and even though this is not yet something that is uh, that is proposed to be in the charter. I hope in the future we can add um, COPA or similar policies like this to be prioritized in the charter. And is this visible? Yes. We have many different cities throughout the country, such as San Francisco and Washington, D.C., that have implemented COPA and TOPA in efforts to support anti-displacement and build ownership possibility for tenants. We also had different speakers um, on our last uh, community uh, 
meeting that talked about COPA and TOPA as well, um, and also talked about real estate. Who might benefit the communities that have historically been impacted by redlining housing segregation and historical disinvestment in communities that majorly have affected black african american descent indigenous latinx and people of color the burden the burden of change weights on everyone all participants both those on the city staff and residents stepping into unfamiliar environments and roles to create sustainable and long-lasting changes for our city and communities that improve social and racial equity accountability and inclusion um, and one more time, is this a, a charter revision? In the future, this policy could be a charter amendment as the city continues to work and implement this policy to combat anti-displacement and promote the prevention of tenant displacement and creation of preservation of community-owned affordable housing. It is important to expand our city charter to address our commitment to housing equity. This recommendation should be in the commission's report as well. Um, and like I mentioned, there are other examples as well that uh, we've seen throughout um, the country. I mentioned here too, but there's more. Um, feel free to look at my list of citations. I have also added some there. Um, and that is it. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Amador. Let's go to the public for comments on either or both of these uh, two proposals. All Soto. Uh, yeah, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Uh, The people in the camps, because of long continued privation, and that's the term that I want in these documents for, from now on, not low income people, not people of limited means, I want the verbiage of long continued privation, are in no shape to fight illness. It is often said that no one starves in the United States, yet in Santa Clara County last year, babies were certified by the local coroner to have died of malnutrition the modern word for starvation, and the less shocking word, although in its connotation, it is perhaps more horrible since it indicates that the suffering was long and drawn out, end quote. This is from Starvation Under the Orange Tree. It was written by John Steinbeck, 1938, after he lived amongst the campesinos, all of, from here to Gilroy. This is, this is the tragedy. These documents right here, the crime is in them because it lacks this accountability. In the language, if you listen to the language, the language is trying to attribute all of the issues to number one, a housing crisis, false. We are not in a housing crisis. Number two is that it is not, except I have 300 of the redlining documents. I don't know if anybody has even looked at one or even knows what one looks like. I have all of them, 300 of them. And in them, there is explicit language that is just, I, I want this city, and I, I can see that I'm gonna have to write, uh, I'm gonna have to write essays, have write essays, staple those, and then put them in the public record and say, now, after reading and studying the analysis that I gave, attaching it to these documents that were produced by the San Jose to create the red line map, now start talking. Tessa Woodmancy. Yes, I, I know that we need to have um, values put into our uh, charter because actually if we look at the X1X, which is our 19th amendment to our charter, it's all about jobs and how everything has to be about economic gain for our city. It's in there, right in the charter. I had no idea. You know, that's what's been so great about this whole process. You know, it just, it's just definitely, you know, brought up, the, you know, to uncover a lot of the workings of, of our city, which has been amazing and so helpful and informative. And I'm very thankful for this charter review. But when we looked at it, the X1X, the 19th Amendment, was all about jobs. So here we are. We really need to be looking at our major crises, and housing is one of them. And one of the issues that my girlfriend has been telling me about it is in saying it's like, you know, you they say that they're building affordable housing in my my neighborhood on Stockton Avenue. But what they do in these housing is they say it's twenty six hundred. And when you put it as twenty six hundred, then the people in Section eight can't can't get in there. So where is the affordable housing? Because twenty six hundred is not affordable for a, for one bedroom. But what it is, is that it has to be only twenty five hundred. So they make it 26 and therefore uh, Section 8 people can't get in there. And so I have no idea. 
you know, all these developers, they say, oh, we're doing Section 8, and, you know, or affordable housing that, that, you know, so we need to put it into our charter so we get more control about what's happening because there's not oversight of how the housing is going. And that's why, you know, we don't prioritize the housing. And that's, I've always said that it's the bottleneck, you know, is the way the, the city has financialized our lands, grabbed our lands for financial growth for the city. Like, and they say, well, we give you what you demand. Yeah, well, not, we're not getting clean air or quiet neighborhoods. We don't get clean air. You know, those are the basic needs that we need. And, and yet they're not giving that to us. So we Chair L. Hi, uh, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm talking on the subject of COPA here. And I would like to say that the, um, the Charter Commission should not recommend COPA. They shouldn't recommend something that's just an idea. We have no draft ordinance from the housing department at this point. So we don't know the details. We don't know if it affects single family homeowners. We don't know if it's partly, we don't know what it is. There's no details. So if, if, if the charter hasn't, commission hasn't reviewed something and understands it thoroughly, they should not recommend that it's just a great idea that should be passed at city council. And I think the other thing is, uh, COPA is gonna be subject to lawsuits, you know? And because it basically takes away uh, an owner's right to advertise. It, it, it forbids people from advertising their property and it forbids people from determining who and when they want to sell their property to. It's basically some kind of like, I mean, you know, it's bordering on just total government takeover of all property rights. So I really think until there's a draft ordinance or something that the commission can actually review and understand and know what it is they're recommending, instead of just saying, oh, this sounds so great because all the buzzwords are there, that this, this commission should wait and spend the time to understand what they're recommending. Um, you know, there's just because something is happening in another city, each city has its own details and different things, and they also have their own unintended consequences and their own problems that happen because of this. So I really recommend that the council that the commission wait, do not recommend something that's just an idea that you don't know what you're doing to property owners, you don't know what you're doing legally, and you don't have any details and it just sounds like such a great idea. Thank you. Call in user two. Couldn't agree more with the last caller. First of all, where's all the money gonna come from for all this housing? I mean, you could never build it. There's not enough land in the world in this state to build the amount of, of low income or opportunity housing. Uh, there's not enough land, there's not enough money. And who's gonna get these properties? Who are gonna be the people whose applications sit on the top of the stack? I mean, you're gonna see payoff and corruption and everything else, kind of like what Tessa said. You know, they, they list these things at a certain price to keep out the low income people, but they were able to build these structures with, with government money from the taxpayer. So they, they could say that they were doing something really great when they really are not. And it's all subsidized by the taxpayer who's overtaxed, overworked, not respected. All levels of government do these kind of things to all of a sudden show that they're actually maybe doing something for somebody, but they're not. They're just lining their own pockets. They're taking kickbacks. They're getting the votes from the people who think they're gonna get something from the government. And it, it's just a, it's a vicious circle. And in this state, the way it's just Democrat controlled, it's a snake eating itself. And uh, in, the, in the case of, once again, the politics here, it's just everybody hating everybody because they're all in the same party, unhappy, unwilling to, understand that the, the, the money tree finally goes bare, right? There's not enough money to go around for all these, these wonderful things that benefit very, very few people. And in the end, it usually ends up benefiting people with a lot of money and a lot of power. And the people who should be getting these things are not, and they're never going to, because there's not enough money. And I would like to hear any other callers who agree with me. Anyway, let's go, Brandon. Thank you. Brenda Doman. Hi, thanks for letting me speak. Um, I wanted to say a few things. First of all, we passed measure 
A in 2016 with the Santa Clara County for a billion dollars of housing. Okay, and they have not even completed half of it, I think, by now. Um, it was supposed to be 6,000 homes for low income and extremely low income people. Um, and, it, and it just seems like this program, the housing in the charter agreement is redundant with the county, which we're already doing. In addition to that, Zillow, they have a house flipping business. Apparently that is failing and they have 7,000 homes that are up for sale um, for 2.8 billion. Okay, we could purchase half of those for a billion dollars, okay? And put people in them. Um, also with regards to, to COPA, I mean, every day I hear on the radio, John buys Bay Area homes. We even buy, your tenant won't buy, pay the rent homes. I mean, why, isn't, why aren't the nonprofits working with real estate professionals like this, okay? To purchase these homes, why do you have to bring, the, you know, the residents and the public and the taxpayers into this system, which is creating just more government jobs that we have to pay for with our tax dollars. Why can't you do this privately? Why can't you do this in the private sector with the nonprofits? Why does government have to be involved? Why does it have to be part of the charter agreement? Why do we need an ordinance for it? Why isn't San Jose working with Santa Clara County to put people in these homes? And with regards to the homeless, 40% of the homeless in San Jose are white people. The majority of the homeless are white. So I don't understand how you're helping them. Sandra? Sandra, there's no last name. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, thank you. Uh, first, I was thanking the commission for all the interesting work they've been doing on and some of the topics they've been looking at. I did have the opportunity to attend a report out that was done by the housing department on the COPA work that they've been doing. What was interesting is when they were asked um, what cities they had looked at in the state of California, the only city that they had looked at was San Francisco. When they were asked, how long has that program been in place? It's been in place less than two years. There were limited to no metrics as to how successful the program was. So I don't think that we even know yet whether COPA or TOPA actually works and under what conditions. They did mention in the housing department that the only way they thought uh, COPA or TOPA could work, especially COPA, was if there was a substantial funding element. And right now, the city of San Jose is running a deficit. We have a terrible housing to job ratio. And so this isn't something to be put in now. It is something for the city to study, which they are studying, and coming up with concrete data as to what might be accomplished or not be accomplished. But I do appreciate the information that was read. I found it informative. And it, that information, which I believe was part of the city of San Jose's report, can be used in the future to pr produce the correct ordinances that would cover this. Um, thank you very much for your time and interest in the subject, but this is not something that should go forward or be placed in the charter. Thank you. Back to the chair. Thank you to all our speakers. We have our final uh, proposal today, which is alter uh, appointments to the San Jose Smart City Advisory Board and the Innovation and Technology Advisory Board. And this would be Commissioner Percival. All right, thank you, Chair Ferrer. I'm gonna um, quickly share here my screen. Okay, so this um, as well is not a charter amendment proposal, but a policy recommendation and I did not intentionally to create the longest title, I think, of <laughs> the group of things that we've talked about today. But anyway, it sort of came out that way. But um, so the title is to alter the appointments to San Jose Smart City Advisory Board and the Innovation Technology Advisory Board with the goal of strengthening community input on the effects and consequences of technological change. And this uh, proposal is a really a direct result from uh, community input 
over the last number of months and issues uh, that the community has felt to be to be important. And I wanted to thank the commissioners on our subcommittee on policing and municipal law accountability and inclusion for um, bringing this to my attention and, and, and trying to um, spend a little more time on engaging on these uh, important issues around technology as we are uh, concluding our, our work in these last couple of months. So a bit of background and context on this issue. Um, as part of uh, San Jose's um, discussions around technology uh, in 2016, it uh, developed the Smart City Vision. Uh, and as part of that effort, two advisory boards uh, were created that report directly to the city manager. And the first of these boards is called the Smart City Advisory Board. And uh, one of its roles and functions is to, and this is directly from the language of the board, obtain expert input from industry thought leaders experience at creating and develop and deploying innovative technology solutions to solve 21st century problems. And a related board, uh, the Innovation and Technology Advisory Board, is designed to, quote, tap the rich expertise of our community in shaping the strategic technology direction of the city. So what is the problem? Well, uh, technological change, including things like artificial intelligence and machine learning, which we've uh, heard a lot of interest about. Certainly there's a lot of people in the community, both in industry and outside the tech industry, thinking about and working on these issues in San Jose and the, the Silicon Valley. Uh, but these intersect with longstanding social and economic challenges in our city and communities. So for example, these technologies will have uh, important implications for the future of work, the kinds of jobs that are available, where work is actually done, whether in city boundaries or outside of city boundaries. That has implications for city tax revenue, individual privacy rights and surveillance and social and economic inequity. It's also technology uh, will affect core city functions, including policing, record keeping, transportation, ener energy, among other issues. And research uh, clearly shows that technological change affects members of our community in very different ways. Um, uh, racial and ethnic minorities, uh, lower income communities, people with less education, uh, those different groups are often the ones to be the, the last to benefit from technology that brings clear benefits, but also the ones that are most harmed when, when technology has negative consequences. So there's a real inequity in how the, the effects of technology are spread throughout our community. But currently there is no requirement that the composition of these boards include community members, um, academic experts, representatives from different neighborhood associations or civic organizations. Because technology affects our community so broadly and in different ways, uh, it's important uh, to have a, a, a broader cross-section uh, and breadth of representation on these boards as their work moves forward in the years ahead. So the policy recommendation is, as I mentioned earlier, not a charter change. There's charter change is, is not necessary, but this would be to uh, in, in this commission's final report to, to recommend to the city council to expand the size and breadth of membership on both the Smart City Advisory Board and the Innovation and Technology Board. The exact number of appointees and the composition of each board would be determined by the city council as uh, the city council has uh, control uh, over boards and commissions and the, the exact nature um, of those would be still be decided by the city council. But importantly, the decisions about these two boards would come in conjunction with consulting the office, city's office of racial equity, different academic, academic experts, and different community and tech, tech industry stakeholders. Now, quickly, arguments against a policy proposal like this. Um, I think as we probably all, all know that technology related issues are very complex, sort of the language and vocabulary we use around these can be really intimidating. Um, and then a high degree of specialized knowledge is, is needed to, to engage on these topics. Um, so discussion and policy recommendations that can be argued is best for people with a familiarity of the tech industry and, and a sense of how to, new technologies are 
developed and deployed. Um, this proposal really challenges that, suggests that there's a lot of really valuable input that can come from community and those who are affected by these kinds of new technologies. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Percival. And now we'll go to the public. Tessa Woodbancy. Mm, thank you very much. Uh, yes, as we look at this um, proposal, and it's addressing the issue of whether it should be a policy change or a charter review. And, you know, and as you can see, the intertwining of this, or, or, you know, that we already have this commission on smart cities and, and making ourselves smarter, whatever, and, and that we're going to include it in a policy change to improve the accessibility to the community. That's all well and good. And, and the issue is, is even, even with our climate crisis, the issue is brought up, should it be a policy or should it be a charter review? And in regards, you know, maybe in regards to this smart city, you know, there's, there aren't such critical issues that we're facing like with our climate um, crisis. And, and so, in, for example, when we were talking about the need uh, with the, the, actually the um, the, the uh, our city itself challenged whether or not we needed a climate um, commission that we already have our smart city we have our well uh, what is it clean clean San Jose whatever it's uh, San Jose San Jose smart which is supposed to be our environmental and there is no accessibility to that and so like I I've been asking you know I I called that I want to know where our greenhouse gases are in our city there was no they said oh you know, they had no time for me. I had to call the head of the department, uh, Carrie Romanow, and complain that I wanted to understand their documentation. And this is where, you know, accessibility to the community is very critical. And that our, 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 our agencies that are under the purview of our politicians, which are so bundled with corporation and, and economic growth, which is all tied to fossil fuels, we, that's, what we, that's why we have to disentangle it with the charter. Maybe this particular um, commission can be, you know, used just as, a, as you know, it's pr proposing it just being a policy change. But you have to critically look at why the climate crisis needs to be a charter. Paul Soto? Uh, uh, yes, uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Um, this, this particular committee, I've been, I've been to uh, probably the meetings over the past two years. And so I'm very familiar with the language and I understand everything that you're saying. And one of the reasons, I'll tell you one of the reasons why. I'm Native American and our culture already knew the process of photosynthesis between the body in terms of your oxygen and your connection with the tree leaf and that there was a relationship there. We didn't... We didn't, we didn't even have a writing system but we knew, we know, why? Because God saw to it that of all the places in the world, he loved me so much that he would make me Chicano and he would birth me here. That's how much he loved me. You had to come here. So I know how valuable San Ho is. And this committee is specifically articulated in both 1984 and Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. Because you're couching in language, such nebulous, it, 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 you, that has no meaning at all. And what gets me is that you guys come to these committees and you present that to the public with a straight face. You really, you really expect us to believe what that document says. And this is the person that, that uh, see, when I talk, it's opinion. When you talk, it's fact. That's gotta go too. Well, who, who determines what's truth? The ones that have the power. And if we already know that that power was extracted from, that, from those crimes against humanity and with the redlining policies, then how can you look at me with a straight face and say that's legitimate and it's with my concern and care in mind? I don't trust this city. I don't trust it. Victor Sin. Good afternoon, Commissioners. My name is Victor Sin. I'm from San Jose and the Santa Clara Valley Chapter of the ACLU of Northern California. 
We support draft recommendation seven to alter appointments to San Jose's Smart City Advisory Board and the Innovation and Technology Advisory Board if there is a deep commitment to increase board membership in order to expand the range of perspectives, backgrounds, and experiences of the appointees. Thank you. Sandra? Yes, thank you very much. And she's not, oh, oh yes, thank you very much. I find an interesting proposal. My only concern is I wanna make sure that broadening does not also reduce expertise. I wanna make sure we have the experts in certain fields in there. Um, and that's really my only comment. Thank you very much for the proposal and um, good luck. Call in user two. Smart cities. This is a smart city. It's an oxymoron. Another Orwellian term, smart cities. You know, we're worried about natural disasters when, well, the natural disasters is the city council, the man, the city manager. We'll include SJPD and SJFD too. Those are the disasters. When it gets to technology though, San Jose, you know what they need to focus on is an old technology is called picking up the telephone. Try to call your local police department, ask them some questions. Nobody answers the phone. They got, what, 52 phone numbers, not one person picks up the phone. Where's the technology there? I'd like the speaker to explain that to me. How about that uh, 311 app? What a pile of crap that thing is. It doesn't work at all. Uh, that's not good technology, right? The, the, once again, 911, is that good technology? That's just telephone technology. In this city and county, they screw it up every single time. You call 911 when that house is on fire and you get put on hold at 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock in the morning. You think there would be enough people staffing that place? No, they're, they're, they're not. I mean, they've got good technology when it comes to the radar guns that they're going to start issuing the police department to give you citations. And they have pretty good technology to mail you a letter to tell you that you owe thousands of dollars in a fine. They're good at that. Right. That's the technology that they excel in. But if you think that the city is going to institute technology to help the citizens and everything else, you're full of it. How about the San Jose PD website? Terrible. How about the city of San Jose website? Terrible. Tell me where the tell me what's smart about those websites. You tell me what's smart about the technology that the city uses. The only thing they're good at is issuing you fines and, and collecting them. Back to the chair. Thank you. And that concludes our public hearing. I want to thank all the members of the public who joined us today in this public hearing and in our study session for all your thoughtful comments. And I appreciate all of the work that the commissioners have put in to making these proposals and for their timeliness in taking very complex issues and somewhat sometimes very um, mit, uh, many issues and bringing them down to a, a very coherent presentation today. I want to thank everyone for their hard work and their presentations. Um, the next meeting of the Charter Review Commission is on November 15th at 5.30, uh, where these discussions will continue in terms of the beginning of our provisional voting. Um, and all of our calendar of meetings are on the city website uh, under the San Jose Charter Commission. Uh, we are in adjournment and thank you all again for your, your participation today.